Today we have uh, three uh, top guest speakers. Uh, the first one is Professor Nicolas Busiopoulos. The second is Professor Jesse Van Grisven. And the third is uh, Dr. Frank Friedman. And then we will have a, a continuation of our uh, course on air pollution modeling, the standard slide that uh, I started yesterday to present to all of you. Uh, so a few words um, of introduction uh, regarding Professor Musiopoulos. Uh, he, I, I believe, uh, Nicolas, I can characterize you with a person that has one foot in Germany and the other foot in Greece. Am I correct? This is correct, yes. You, are, you had a fantastic career in sciences, environmental sciences, engineering and air pollution, both in Germany and in Greece. Uh, I'm going to share with the participant is, uh, this, this page of summary of some of your achievements, but you have, you have dedicated a lifetime to uh, uh, engineering and uh, uh, modeling, especially air pollution modeling. So uh, I'm going to stop my share, and uh, uh, you can share your presentation, Nicolas. So I try it now. Very good. Here I am. And I need to enlarge it if I have the chance. I think it should work. Well, uh, should I start? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, dear Paolo, dear students, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, what I would thought to do, uh, as I'm the first of, out of three speakers, is to make clear that such uh, things like air pollution models are not uh, only for science, not only for maybe um, uh, deciding where to uh, position um, monitoring uh, stations, uh, but also it can help considerably policy making. So I thought of presenting you two case studies um, of the in, from the past, of course, where uh, these models proved to be quite um, sub of substantial help for policymakers. And the first of, of course, as I was born in Athens, uh, has to do with the um, Olympics in Athens 2004, um, uh, which, um, uh, of course, uh, it, it, was, it was not very easy to convince people uh, to uh, um, uh, accept that the games take place in Athens simply because the city was well known for severe um, air pollution problems. And so uh, what we did uh, is we um, started uh, very early, of course, um, uh, with a concept of a study in order to um, uh, prove that uh, the air quality during the games would be acceptable. Uh, and so th this is what I would like to present to you. Uh, in uh, this is the first case, which is the longer run. Uh, after a brief introduction, I will uh, simply go through the history of the smog abatement in Athens and then present to you the main elements of the air quality study Athens to 2004 and present also some conclusions. As I said, uh, everybody, uh, or, or including the International Olympic Committee, knew that uh, pollution problems in Athens were severe. Uh, already visible from uh, such pictures of the metope of the Parthenon, how it uh, deteriorated uh, within the 20th century. Uh, and this, the reason for this was both uh, a very uh, heavy and polluting industry uh, in, in Athens. Uh, the Athens Basin, by the way, is just this area here with the coast. You know? And so um, it was quite enough industry within the basin, but also in the in an adjacent plain to the west of uh, Athens. And as here, this, this is not a real mountain, these are hills. Uh, by the way, on the top of this hill, um, the Persian king uh, was watching the Salamis um, uh, battle in 480 BC. Uh, so 400 meters and not more, so that's all the pollutants from this place could easily penetrate into the Athens basin. And there have been severe uh, messages, um, even for SO2 in the early 80s, uh, approaching the um, limit values of the United uh, European Union for that time. Uh, even dust was um, actually above the uh, limit values, 
but at that time we did not measure PM, we measured total suspended particles, and there were limit values for the, this uh, assembly of particles as well, called dust. And we had uh, here problems, especially in this first station, which is downtown, it is a traffic station um, uh, in a larger street uh, in the center, of, not close to the center of Athens. I will return to this in a moment. And even worse, um, um, we seem to have, because of the very large uh, increase of in motorization in the city, an in, uh, increasing uh, ozone concentration over the years, uh, indicating that photochemical smog was uh, evolving and uh, was becoming quite a large problem in the 80s. So the government, 1990, and it was just a few months after I returned to Greece, Paolo, from <clears throat> my uh, long period in Germany, uh, invited um, a colleague and myself to suggest what to do. And the first thing we said to them is simply do something with the car traffic. And so uh, we convinced the government to have these four measures uh, legislated. The first and the fourth were uh, really implemented almost instantaneously. Uh, a scrappage incentive. <clears throat> Everybody who uh, was purchasing 1990 and after that, a catalyst equipped car got reductions in the price if he would scrap at the same time uh, his old uh, polluting uh, vehicle. And the last one is actually an exhaust uh, control car, which means that we had a yearly at least control of the, of the quality of the exhaust of the car uh, as a necessity for getting a permit to drive th through the city. And, not only, and this was not uh, in, uh, practiced in Greece before that, by the way. The other two things were legislated, but actually uh, not implemented. If time remains at the end in the discussion, I could explain the reasons. It was the first time in any case that we had a holistic <coughs> smoke abatement by taking into consideration all aspects, at least as the uh, car traffic is concerned. And of course, uh, this um, brought results. Uh, you see here the carbon monoxide evolution, uh, <coughs> which uh, changed dramatically after 1990. We get uh, almost everywhere reductions so that the carbon monoxide, which used to be a problem in the early 80s, <coughs> stopped to be a problem anymore. And ozone, of course, uh, somehow showed uh, a small reduction, I would say, or at least the end of the increase, but remained at high levels until the mid of the 90s. And this was alarming for the International Olympic Committee, same as the uh, nitrogen dioxide, which in this uh, um, um, street uh, uh, of Athens, this uh, <coughs> hot spot, I would say, still exceeded the given EU limit value in the mid of the 90s. Uh, although in other stations, one could see a, a, an improvement because of mainly of this scrappage incentive. We renewed the fleets and this led to le uh, less emissions, of course. Uh, therefore, the government, from the moment that they wanted to attract the games to Athens, decided to uh, uh, plan a number of large public works, the most important being the uh, moving the airport uh, to the place which I show with the mouse. Initially, it was in this area. Uh, by the way, this area, the old airport, is at the moment the largest public work in Europe, actually, uh, because and we are involved in the study for early permit of uh, some of the facilities there, including uh, casino, uh, uh, marinas, um, uh, hotels, uh, very luxur luxurious apartments and other things. Uh, but uh, in the mid of the 90s, about 40, uh, 94, sorry, uh, 94 or 95, uh, we conducted the um, study for the uh, airport, and it, it was very clear that this would remove a major pollution reason from the major basin in Athen uh, of, the, of Athens, not only because of the airport operation itself, but also because of the traffic which went from the center, which is somewhere here, to the airport. In addition, we um, in increased the metro uh, network. We had uh, already in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, one line which operated, but uh, then these, uh, um, you cannot recognize them, I see them. Uh, there were two additional lines of metro, and especially, of course, also this motorway, which I show here, which would link the um, this Western plane uh, with the industrial activities uh, to the uh, new airport. 
uh, and we also had a major improvement of existing existing network so that um, the government thought that with these uh, interventions um, the situation would improve um, qu quite a lot and our job was to check whether this is really the case and whether we could convince them the international olympic committee that uh, the games could take place because all these public works all these infrastructure improvement including also a tram line by the way uh, would um, be finished 2002. The airport started operating, by the way, 2001. And so the question was, would we achieve a real significant improvement in air pollution levels by the year 2004? And the study took place from November 96 till February of 97. We considered three scenarios, a kind of uh, baseline. We took the 1990 scenario. Uh, as a baseline, and then we had uh, a do-nothing scenario. So what would have be expected by 2004 without these public works and other interventions? And the reference scenario for 2004, taking into account all these things, uh, as well as the resulting reduction in the use of automobiles, which happened uh, thanks to these interventions. Because with the metro, some people thought it is an idiotic to take the car to go to the town, to go downtown. The study was uh, subdivided, if you want, in five chapters. First of all, we had to uh, calculate uh, the traffic load for all these scenarios and then forecast uh, both the uh, fleet composition and uh, the emission factors in order to arrive at an emissions inventory. The most important part, of course, the air quality predictions. And at the end of the study, we also offered some ideas on possible additional interventions. Let's start briefly with the traffic load uh, estimation. And I showed before this new uh, motorway, which is actually this one, which is an additional line. And there have been a few uh, changes in the existing network, as I said, because some of the existing uh, roads uh, were uh, um, uh, modified with an additional lane, for instance, so that we uh, ho hoped that this new network would be better as regards the air quality situation in the city. Now, what about the fleet composition and the emission factors? First of all, uh, in the motorization in Athens was quite low for European standards 1990. And therefore, it was clear that we would have an increase by a considerable increase, as you see here, something like uh, even more than 50%, uh, according to this uh, um, uh, plot to the left, huh? uh, but the lucky situation was that as we started 1990 with the uh, catalytic technology, we uh, thought that we would have 2004, the majority of the pas uh, passenger cars uh, equipped with a catalyst and the drastic reduction of the old fashioned non-catalyst cars between 1990 and 2004. And you will see that this is significant. This is really a very important change. Uh, uh, we had uh, an increase in two wheelers as well, and this is a problem because the two wheelers in Greece, uh, if you have been in Greece, you have noticed that we have a large majority of uh, um, home, let's say, uh, constructed two wheelers from scrap, which we imp import from other countries. And uh, usually um, these uh, th things emit too many VOCs, which are not very good for, for the chemistry, as most of you might know. In any case, 50% uh, more vehicles and, of course, also an increase in mileage, uh, especially for the do-nothing scenario, because in the do-nothing scenario, you would, we would have the increase in cars without the alternatives of the metro, for instance, uh, and therefore, in the reference scenario, the mileage would, uh, increase, or would increase, at least this was our prediction, 1996 and 1997, much less than in the case of the do-nothing scenario. Now, the major uh, effects here are the emission factors, because if you compare the uh, um, for a mean speed of 20 kilometers per hour, which might be even high as an average speed in a very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in a city filled with cars like Athens, uh, conventional uh, emission factors, if, if you compare here, are almost, uh, I would say, uh, one factor of many, or more than one factor of magnitude higher than the uh, various uh, emission factors for the catalytic uh, cars. So this means 
a catalytic car emits approximately or even less than one tenth of the pollutants compared to an uh, old fashioned car without a catalyst. And this uh, explains, of course, here in the main results, where is the significant improvement as the uh, catalytic cars from 1990 to 2004 uh, uh, climbed up to 70% uh, of the total, a share of 70%, we could expect, in spite of the uh, fleet increase, much less emissions. Therefore, um, uh, this would counterbalance the increase also of the total uh, mileage. And this will be shown to you in a moment, actually now, <laughs> because as you see here, the total uh, tra road traffic emissions uh, decrease less in the case of an NOx. I will explain the reason in a moment. Much dramatically, more dramatically for carbon monoxide and VOCs. Uh, in the case of uh, the uh, uh, of the NOx. Uh, we do have uh, the problem of the heavy duties, trucks and buses. As you uh, uh, see these bars here, the, the darker blue, are the uh, trucks and buses. And they were not touched upon <laughs> at, at that time, uh, would, although we suggested to, to do something, but this was politically impossible. And by the way, I open now a bracket. It's important in nowadays to really start the electrification or use of uh, refuels with such heavy duty uh, vehicles because they are polluting most in our modern cities at the moment. Now uh, to the uh, the total emissions, because not only road traffic causes the pro problem. You, repeat, you see here the repetition of the situation of the road traffic. This is here now the, the light blue uh, color. Uh, as you can see, this dominates because the other polluters uh, are uh, not so dramatically changed over the three scenarios, with the exception of the airport. As you see, uh, the airport cause, caused uh, an increase of NOx. Greece is a country that attracts tourists, and the major reason for the increase is that uh, in, in periods which uh, where we don't have emergencies like the pandemic, uh, we have quite a lot of uh, traffic which has to do with uh, or the operation of the airport itself because of the larger number of flights leads to higher emissions. And another aspect which is quite important is that all these net road networks, uh, the road network uh, uh, peculiarities I presented before, led to somehow a widening of the emission area to uh, um, the, peri the periphery of the city. Uh, if you count the red and orange uh, boxes, uh, where, which are his square kilometers in the center, then you see that 2004 we have much less um, uh, of these uh, uh, of these uh, 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 grid cells with very high emissions. If you want, it's like an iceberg which uh, becomes wider, and maybe the summit remains uh, quite high, but it's only a very small part of uh, the iceberg. It's not, not a, a tableau at the top. Therefore, uh, more, uh, more, let's say, widely distributed traffic, which, as you will see in a moment, um, has a beneficial uh, impact on air quality. So the main results regarding the emissions uh, at all, uh, as a total, First of all, uh, a decrease in NOx emissions, which is not significant, but we have larger reductions in the emissions of CO and VOCs. And as I said, the reason for the uh, smaller uh, reduction of NOx emissions were the heavy duties. Now to the air quality. My uh, suggestion at that time to the ministry and to the responsible people of the Greek board you know, of the Olympic Committee was not to rely only on uh, Greek groups. Uh, apart from our group, uh, was another very important group at that time, headed by uh, my distinguished colleague, John Bartis, whom uh, some of you may know, uh, in, uh, in Athens at that time, and in the Democritus Research Center. So these groups represent Greece, but we invited two reputed groups from out of Greece, one from uh, Karlsruhe in Germany, uh, uh, a collaboration of the, at that time, of the university and the research center, which, by the way, 13 years ago merged, and now it's the Cultural Institute of Technology. Uh, and of course, also the Swiss colleagues from the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, 
uh, a PFL, uh, and we wanted the, all, all groups to work with their own models using identical input data. And what we did, uh, Paolo, I believe we were the first to attempt what we call in the meantime and practice in the meantime several times, ensemble modeling. So apply several models and then uh, try to see whether the response of the models is uh, somehow uh, the same. So we have homogeneity on the results or if we have not such a homogeneity, something should be wrong. You will judge yourself. Allow me to present uh, our own model system, which has a, a development history of about, or even less, more than 30 years. It, it, it indeed started in collaboration of uh, Germany and uh, Greece, as pa Paolo said in the beginning. In the last 10, 12 years, it's only in Greece, of course. Uh, and we have a number of uh, models, which I cannot uh, not want to present in detail, but the major uh, models is a prognostic mesoscale model, which uh, calculates the wind flow in the area of interest, which is called MIMO, and the uh, family of Mars, which uh, has a number of sub-models, which uh, uh, is a, a, mo a model, a ke chemical transport model, actually. And in the meantime, we have uh, the online coupling because uh, the um, uh, aerosol layers formed in a, a city uh, of course, uh, have an impact on the stability and on the uh, on the, uh, uh, via the stability on the wind uh, flow in a city. So online coupling uh, for the last ten years is now a standard for most of the model systems, including the community models uh, like Wolf and uh, others. Uh, our model system started de de uh, being developed within the very important Eurotruck. Uh, sub-project uh, Saturn. Uh, this was in the uh, early century, <laughs> to 2000 about. Then we uh, it continued in the network of excellence accent, and the major uh, um, demonstrations of um, uh, good practice of the models was then also possible within the Megapoli project, which was a milestone in Europe with the participation of several strong groups all over Europe. No time for more details. So again, again, MEMO and MARS are the two important uh, models which we are using. Uh, only to give you uh, an impression on how uh, the uh, uh, results look like compared to observations. The observations are these, uh, uh, well, red symbols. Uh, the simulation results, uh, the green curves for a very uh, typical day, which is uh, as adverse meteorological situation for the city uh, of Athens. Uh, it was uh, co considered to be a standard case, which we asked all other modelers to treat. Uh, of course, those who are experienced with such models would uh, say that most uh, features of the uh, observed situation are well uh, represented by the model. In the uh, uh, hotspot situation in this uh, station, I showed you twice already. We cannot catch the maximum values because this is a small scale effect because of the street canyon type of uh, of the site there, and this cannot be uh, represented by a model which has a resolution of one kilometer, as we used for this type of work at the time. Important, however, is now to see how the maximum concentrations are distributed in Athens, both in the baseline situation 1990 and in the situation 2004 for the reference scenario. And you will, of course, uh, accept my opinion that this, there is a dramatic improvement because you see the maximum is somewhere of the, in the order of a little above 700, whereas here we ex exceeded 1,000 micrograms per cubic meter for NOx. And the same was done by the other modelers. And what you see here is the uh, 50 highest, the 50 top concentrations uh, for 1990 and 2004 calculated by all four models. They are in all these uh, results, the 50 highest concentrations are within these uh, bands for the, the two years. And what one can follow from this result is that indeed all these interventions and public works lead to a really considerable improvement if we take 500 for NOx for the sum of NO2 and uh, nitric oxide, 
to be uh, uh, something like a limit, which we would like to not to be exceeded uh, in several places. Then you will find out that we had uh, at least 35 or 40 locations where we had an exceedance 1990 and less than 10 uh, square kilometers in the center of the city, far away from the Olympic Stadium, by the way, where we would not have exceedance in 2004. So actually a significant um, uh, result, I would say. And uh, what I like most is actually this uh, final uh, uh, slide for the air quality simulations for Athens. If you start as a policymaker with the activities in the city, you do not want to kill the city with the reductions of activities. People have to move, you need uh, traffic, you need all these things that a uh, city or for the uh, do domestic uh, uh, em emissions, which I did not mention before. Uh, so the activities um, uh, between 1990 and 2004, as, as I said before, are expected to increase, especially the use of the car, in spite of the uh, of the um, new um, metro and so on. Uh, but the emissions, as I showed already, uh, are found to decrease for traffic much more, uh, even for industry. Uh, and so, therefore, you see for the same uh, level of activities, you would have even much less emissions than 100%, uh, even less than 80%. And if you now calculate the concentrations here in terms of NOx, then you find out that you are really quite low, where about 60% compared to 1990 as regards the maximum values. And even more important, if you integrate for the overall airshed and you calculate the exposure for the overall airshed, then you end up with less than 50%. And this convinced uh, Mr. Bach, who was at that time the chairman of the German Olympic Committee. Today, he is the president of the International Olympic Committee. And he made the joke to me that what you present here should uh, are be sufficient to recommend Athens as a climate and uh, air quality spa area so that people who are sick come to Athens to breathe uh, fresh air. I don't know whether this is the case, and it was a joke, but the games took place. So uh, the main results are repeated here. I don't want to read them. You will have access to the uh, to the uh, uh, slides, I hope, and then you can read everything. Uh, and only as far as ozone is concerned, with our model, we had a second model which also calculated ozone. Again, a very clear improvement. So uh, less than fifty percent actually compared to the nineteen ninety levels. Uh, I don't have time to discuss at all the effect of the additional interventions. Uh, only one point here, technology is best. So if you reduce further the emission factors, you have a clean fleet, a fleet and now the electrification appears to be exactly the indicated way, then you can uh, gain much more and arrive at really very, very low air pollution levels so that we uh, modelers could become jobless at the end of the day. So the conclusions are repeated here. I don't read all, 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 but the last one, because the main result of the air quality study Athens 2004 were confirmed with observations during the games and the later years. And as you can imagine, it is a, for a modeler a very nice situation if uh, what he su suggested or predicted seven years ago appeared to be correct uh, in, uh, a posteriori with measurements after seven years. Now, uh, after I presented this Athens case study, I would like to jump uh, in the last 10 minutes because after that we will have maybe five minutes if, in case you have questions, because there are quite a number of possible applications important for policy making which had to do with industry. And what I present here was a major study which was discussed considerably in our city in Thessaloniki when the Titan Thessaloniki plants uh, producing cement wanted to apply uh, alternative fuels. I uh, will, uh, our team was involved in, um, in, in, in estimating what this means for equality, but I will go uh, jump over the introduction, the objectives, uh, and then to show to you how we quantified the emissions and what we did to assess equality. 
in fact, uh, what uh, those who are not introduced in the uh, problem of uh, um, energy and cement production uh, do not uh, should should know that we in, uh, have a, quite a number of reasons to avoid using fossil fuels uh, uh, apart from the climate question, of course. First of all, uh, even if we do not consider the climate question, uh, some of these fossil fuels could better be, uh, be used for other purposes and not uh, as, as a, really a fuel which is burnt for cement production if we have an alternative. It appears to be cheaper, especially if you have a, um, a holistic approach because such uh, alternative fuels may be uh, residues of, uh, of uh, recycling and uh, you cannot do much more than burn them. If you don't burn them, it's very expensive to find ways to manage them. And what uh, we believe from the very beginning is that we could even achieve emission reductions and even quality improvements. You will see in a moment whether this is correct or not. And as I already said, uh, well, uh, much better disposal of waste which uh, is possible through the cement production. And of course, for all these reasons in, the, in Europe, uh, we had uh, uh, very uh, intense uh, use of uh, the, the fuels and uh, I would say ever increasing. Um, when um, we performed this study for Thessaloniki, some years ago, it was exceeded already 30% in Europe. In Greece, we were still by uh, around 10% only. And so our aim was to see what would be the consequences of having uh, noticeable use of alternative fuels in our factory of Titan company in Thessaloniki. Why is this uh, important? Because this is important because what you do when you produce cement is pr primarily you are pr pr producing what is called clinker. And this clinker uh, is in a position to uh, incorporate in its structure what else in other situations of burning would be an ash. So you do not have an ash. It is somehow included in the clinker, which is produced so that even uh, problematic uh, uh, alternative fuels, which produce uh, would have produced an ash if you would burn them in another way, uh, would, could be a problematic residue in order to be disposed. If it's in the clinker, it's not a problem anymore. And this is a major idea. And by the way, the temperatures which you see here in these rotating uh, 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 kilns, it's a rotary kiln, uh, kiln uh, which is the basis of this burning, um, they are uh, so high that you actually have no production of dioxins and furans, which appear to be always quite a problem from the plastics that are maybe included in these uh, alternative fuels. So as, again, all these uh, raw material, which uh, could be problematic after the uh, energetic uh, use in the uh, cement uh, factory are incorporated in the clinker and do not, not produce any problems. So enough with cement, we have uh, limit values set by the European legislation. And what we did uh, here is actually we considered three scenarios, as I will tell you in a moment, in order to um, improve uh, the situation uh, for all these reasons that I already mentioned, economically, the height of emissions, and of course, also air quality, as you will see in a moment. It is not a problem that these uh, two different types of uh, alternative fuels have a smaller calorific value compared to the pet coke, which is the uh, original uh, uh, fuel used by Titan in Thessaloniki, and this is something that most of the cement uh, plants were using before they jumped, to some extent at least, to alternative fuels. But the value is still acceptable compared to the uh, very low calorific value of lignite that is being burned still today in some places in Greece to produce electricity. We are abandoning, of course, this in the course of the defossilization, but this is another story for another talk in another workshop. No time for describing the two types of uh, residues. The one has to do with um, the um, recycling of uh, old cars. I spoke on scrappage some 
minutes ago in Athens. So if you do not sell the car elsewhere, which it was not allowed, it had to be scrapped, then you have to somehow deal with the uh, with the residues. And this is, of course, a way to deal with what is not uh, recycled in another way. So all the things that are actually uh, garbage and should, would have to be deposited somewhere or burnt producing uh, dangerous uh, ash could easily be uh, an alternative fuel for cements. The same is true for the solid recovered fuels, which is what cannot be recycled from the collection of all the um, uh, things that we are separately co collecting in most of our countries, like paper, uh, card, wood, textiles, and plastic. So the Titan already had uh, small fractions of these two types uh, tested in their facility, but they wanted to increase the percentage to end up with 30%, uh, either with the uh, automobile residues or for the residues of the, the recycling uh, of the uh, materials I mentioned before. And so the three scenarios were the business as usual, and the at that time future scenarios A and B with the 30% uh, share of alternative fuel. In the case of the business as usual, uh, we wanted to uh, compare what the company measured measured in their facility for the year 2017 against emission estimates as for the two scenarios A and B. We would not be able to have any measurements because they, these were future scenarios. So with the con comparison for the ba uh, base case, we were uh, able to check whether our estimates were on the safe side, rather conservative, or not. And this would uh, allow us to convince uh, those uh, uh, approving our, our uh, study uh, that we uh, actually um, took into account the worst case for the future situation. And what you see here is for the base case, the, the comparison between what uh, comes out for the emissions in case of uh, we use the measurements of Titan, which were uh, certified, by the way, and the estimates. In the case of SO2 and dust, no discussion, uh, tremendous difference. Not so much in the case of the most problematic pollutant here, again, NO2, by the way, here, with the, the estimates, uh, um, were was slightly above the um, the legislated emission value, the permitted emission standard, whereas the measurement was below. So, if we now compare the base case with scenarios, then you see that uh, using these estimates, which for uh, the blue curve, the blue bar would be uh, for NO2 uh, exceeding the standard, but. The scenarios are in NO2 clearly below, clearly below, so clearly also below the standard uh, according to the European legislation. In case of SO2 and PM10, we have also slight differences in the correct direction, so in decrease, uh, but we are far from the standard. And the same is true, by the way, and again, I don't repeat uh, all things, you can read them again if you want, but especially for hydrochloric acid, um, uh, carbon monoxide, and some metals. We do have increased emissions in the case of the alternative fuels, but we are here two orders of magnitude below the limits of the permitted emissions, so that we don't need to take care. We are far uh, below uh, what uh, actually the uh, government wanted to see. And as I said, dioxin and furan emission rates are also well below the limit value because of the high temperatures prevailing in the rotary kiln. The emissions uh, were then fed into the models, and so we use the Lagrangian type model. This is the Austal 2000. This was a year of its uh, first appearance. In the meantime, it is, has been steadily improved. It is the one which is recommended by the German Federal Environmental Service. It uses uh, diagnostically calculated wind fields, and we applied it for a 10 times 10 square kilometer area uh, with a stack in the center. Uh, we applied it for the calendar year 2017 and for the future years, of course, uh, for the uh, scenarios which we assumed. Uh, the, um, this diagnostic wind model has to be fed with measurements, and where we didn't have measurements, we used results with our prognostic, uh, calculated with our prognostic mesoscale uh, model. 
uh, we did not have any other reason to deal with chemical transformation simply because these 10 kilometers are not uh, enough in order that much chemistry evolves with the um, exception of the oxidation of nitric oxide to nitrogen dioxide. And we also took into account plume rise. And I know that later you will get some lecture on plume rise models, so I don't need to say anything on that. Here uh, you see the collection of the geometric and uh, exhaust gas characteristic data, which we used in the calculations. And now the results. What we do in such situations is we dis uh, distinguish several classes of wind directions uh, clustered in, uh, I think it was here, 12 uh, angles. And uh, the most uh, frequent meteorological situation here were westerly winds. And the second uh, mo most frequent easterly winds. Uh, the third one was because of the sea breeze, uh, southerly winds. And uh, you recognize that we do have here maximum values in areas which are not populated. There are no residential areas there. And interestingly, as always in such cases, uh, as I said, the um, stack it was just somewhere here. And the closest village, which is this one, I don't want you to memorize it, it's Efkarpia, were angry and were shouting and demonstrating, but they are the only who have no no, uh, let's say, uh, negative uh, uh, consequence at all because of the operating stack of this uh, cement factory. Simply because of the height of the stack, no problems with those who sh shout most loud compared to all the others. This here for PM10, similar for NO2. Again, here the uh, situation, uh, not, uh, not uh, any anywhere where uh, population is residing, but even there, uh, the pet coke would have produced more pollution, by the way. It's simply the uh, impact of the emissions, but uh, much lower compared to the uh, to the pet coke scenario, uh, which we, you see actually here, where you uh, see the, um, uh, first of all, for the baseline, uh, the, dif uh, the difference in the concentrations, if you assume here the, um, esti the estimates uh, in, on the safe side, which is the uh, uh, which is uh, violet uh, color, compared to the measurements, uh, the, the emission uh, data, the, the, which were computed uh, using the measurements of the company, far below the standards, by the way, the concentrations. And the same is true, even more uh, reduced values more for all these pollutants. Uh, if you compare the scenarios A and B against the business as usual. So conclusions, uh, we have here uh, less emissions. We have uh, better, uh, lower concentrations uh, with the alternative fuels. And this means that we have four improvements. Cost is lower. We find a solution for problematic uh, residues. Uh, we uh, have uh, uh, lower uh, emissions of all pollutants and a better air quality. So use, this is the last bullet point in my last sentence, uh, use more alternative fuels is beneficial environmentally and should therefore be followed uh, considerably more than, than so far. Thank you for your attention. My hope was to have some time for discussion. I took 42 minutes, I think. Paolo, I don't know. If you would allow the one or the other uh, question, I would be prepared to answer it. Certainly. If there is any question, uh, go ahead. Yes, I have one question. Um, I just want to ask you the activity data or the stack emissions taken in consideration for this second case study was only for one year? Yes, yes, they were. But I showed you only the percentage of the activities compared to the activities 1990. So it was uh, approximately 40% or something like that increased activity as it gas traffic, the okay. mo moving uh, people, goods, uh, which is uh, normal in a city which is uh, developing. Uh, and this uh, led, nevertheless, as you said at the end, to a Exposure, which was less than fifty percent, uh, uh, less than fifty percent of the, that of nineteen ninety, so an incredible okay. uh, success. And I said that this was even confirmed by measurements twenty o four. 
Okay. And just wonder to know if you have other case studies that don't consider emissions from fuel consumption, but maybe from other kind of like waste or uh, agriculture that may be leading in problems in their pollution. You mean now in other study, other case studies? Uh, yes, or... not sure if maybe, not sure if maybe how you have considered other case studies, not just related to fuel consumption. But... Yes, of course. <laughs> I could provide to you uh, links to uh, when we were involved as consultants, major public works in Greece, uh, air, uh, airports, and uh, such facilities like waste treatment. Okay. Uh, facilities and this uh, is uh, important air quality uh, impacts have to be studied whenever a permit is ne necessary for a public work uh, for any work even private companies uh, uh, call us if they have to um, uh, submit an environmental impact assessment study because they have to prove that what they do will not lead to a deterioration of air quality and this is uh, one of the reasons that such models that uh, Paolo Zanetti will then discuss with you uh, continue discussing with you this afternoon and uh, tomorrow afternoon for Europe for Paolo <laughs> yeah. uh, is one of the reasons why we need people trained in, mod in models so that they can be themselves later on maybe consultants to companies if they really need this expertise for their for this for their permits okay thank you that that's all from my end you're welcome so very good any other question no thank you very good well professor Musiopoulos, thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, uh, send me the slides uh, or anything that you want to share with the participants uh, and I will forward the material to them. And uh, we will restart uh, at 7, uh, um, 7 a.m. my time uh, in about 10 minutes with, uh, with uh, Jesse. Thanks very much Thank as well. You. It was a pleasure for me. Thanks again, Nick. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy the talk of Jesse, dear students. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's seven o'clock my time. So let's start the second uh, uh, presentation today with the guest speaker, Professor Jesse Van Griesven. I hope I didn't mispronounce your name, Jesse. Uh, I'm and... sorry, but <laughs> All good. Tutto Pre bene. Tutto bene. Professor Jesse is uh, uh, has enormous accomplishment both as a university professor in the academic work at the prestigious University of Waterloo in Canada, and also as an air pollution consultant. He is the president of Lakes Environmental Software, a company that I like very much for their products. Uh, they have created a user-friendly version of many, many models that are available in a standard version, but I always recommend people to buy the user-friendly version because it will save you a lot, a lot of time uh, when you run the model. So uh, I'm going to stop my share and uh, <coughs> Professor Jesse, you can start. Thank you very much, Paolo. Let me, uh, ahead of time, thank you for inviting to present at uh, your event. I would like to also thank the participants. I'll share my screen and I will be uh, presenting one second here. Let me actually do screen one. There. Can you see the screen? Yes, I do we not, can see it. I do not know how much uh, how much has uh, Paulo taught. So I'm going to give a presentation, and my name is uh, Jesse. I go by Jesse T on uh, air dispersion modeling at the university. I'm uh, Jesse Van Griesven, and 
So I'm going to talk about air dispersion modeling very quickly, and then do a compar comparison path versus plume. Then I'll give you a demonstration on a dispersion model and how easy it is today to put a model together. So EDM uh, concepts, a dispersion modeling concepts. I'll start very simply. So we have a source, we have a receptor, and we have four uh, things that will happen to that. In reality, we call advection and diffusion as dispersion. That's why we say dispersion modeling. Uh, we have transformation, so we can emit a sulfur that will, uh, SO2, that will then become aerosol or sulfuric acids. Advection is the fact that the wind can come and push things. If I have a piece of paper and the wind is blowing that paper, it is the advection of that piece of paper. But however, if I have a, oops, sorry. If I have a piece of paper, I cut it in many, many, many pieces and the wind takes, you will see that each piece will go in a different way. So the pieces as are, the wind is taking, they get farther and farther apart. That is diffusion. And we talk about turbulent diffusion because molecular diffusion is so tiny, we ignore. So turbulence can be a million times faster for the mixing than molecular diffusion for the scales we're talking about. So then we have removal processes, I emit. It can rain, for example, and I'm sure Professor Paolo Zanetti already presented this, and then it removes from the plume. Now, the plume, we need to know that a real plume instantaneously, you will see them like this. And that's not what the models reproduce. Well, there are certain models that I will talk about later that can reproduce that, but the models are usually Gaussian models. And what are these? So in a few seconds, the plume looked like this, which would be this plume here. And then another time it behaved like the yellow one and then the red one. So over 10 minutes minimum, if I put a straight line here, I'm trying to do it straight. And I measure here every second and I measure all over, and I do it for 10 minutes, I have 600 measurements, right? So what we do is we get all the measurements, we sum them up, sum all the 600 measurements, and this is measurements, and we divide by 600. That's how we do the averaging here. Now, if I do for each of these points this average, let's say we have many, many points here, then I plot this, I can do this in Excel, and then the plume will be Gaussian. So a Gaussian plume requires an averaging at a minimum time, and it's bigger, but a minimum 10 minutes. It's important that you know this. And I can show you that this the plume from these stacks at, at a refinery, they would be oscillating like this. And the next time they would be oscillating like that. And But if you get the average, you can see here, it's a Gaussian plume, okay? So it's the average. So if I open, the photograph here opens the shutter and allow it to stay open for 10 minutes. Plumes are not like that in the real world. But if I allow it to do be there, then the average shows on the picture. So here's what I mean. It will be Gaussian on the y-axis. So downstream be the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we call that the crosswind the y-axis, then it will be Gaussian. And on the vertical, the z-axis or the z-axis, it will be Gaussian. 
there are certain things we can talk about. We do not have the time to talk about uh, by Gaussian, but you get the idea here. That's all we need to know for now. Now the coordinate system, when the models are running, they understand the wind, understand this, and they understand the crosswind and the vertical, but they do not know what is north, south, east, and west. So we compute it, and then we have to rotate and move it to the right direction. So you can see when we release the plume, concentration is all centered here along the center line. And as ambient air comes in mix, you will see that it dilutes the plume and it spreads the plume and the distribution will be like that. Another thing we need to consider is that as we release the plume, the air is hot, so we have temperature difference, so buoyancy will take the plume up. And we also have exit velocity. And it's the vertical component. So if you have a stack, and you could have stacks in different angles, you have a stack that looks like this. Then the velocity is like that. And we have a component here. And we have a component here. So what matters is this component here, OK? So when you have stacks like this, you can find out, you know, this angle here. So you apply the sine of this V exit here, and then you have the V exit in the Y direction, okay? That's what you want to have, this one here, all right? So when we have plume rise, it, ha it matters because what is, important in the dispersion modeling is the effective stack height. So we have the physical stack height plus the plume rise here to here. Okay, so plume rise matters. I will not spend time here to describe, but you can see it, that it's evident because the taller the stack, the longer it will take for it and it has more time to dilute. This is a process of dilution. We get the plume, has high concentration, ambient air mixes with it, increasing the volume, but the mass of pollutants or chemicals or toxics is the same. So therefore, the volume is bigger for the same mass, you dilute the plume. So when it hits the ground, then the concentration is smaller if the stack is higher in general terms, okay? Now let me summarize this. So we have exit velocity, the wind comes instead of the plume going horizontal, uh, vertically like this, the wind bends the plume. Plume oscillates and it oscillates like this and like that, etc. We get the Gaussian distribution, okay? Now let's talk about building the wash. And then the building the wash, you can see here, the wind comes, I need another color. The wind comes, hits, the building cannot go through, so it goes around, and the rest all goes up and comes down. As it comes down, here there's a zone of low pressure, it brings the plume down. Now, remember, I can have a wind tunnel where I can put a, an airplane as an example, and I can analyze the plane static, the wind blowing against the plane or a car or a building in a wind tunnel. The building is not moving, the wind is coming against the building, but I can, it doesn't matter. I can get the wind against the airplane. It's the same as the plane going against the wind, okay? That's why we have wind tunnels. So now you can see here experiments where we get, But these almost we have to release uh, this these lines and they go and hit and go go through so they go around and they mix over here 
and then they will and they go okay so one problem with building the wash is if i have a stack let's say i have a stack over here sorry it's not as straight as i wish i'm using my mouse it will bring the plume down so fast it does not have time to dilute therefore the concentrations will be higher then if it had time to dilute and when it hits the ground, concentration will be lower. This can be up to, not that it will always be, but it can be up to 10 times higher. Usually like 20%, two times higher. And I'm just displaying here, I cannot see air, so I release smoke and you can see what we are talking about. This could be a building. And this line here, we call a streamline. And we need to compute things such that there is a height where the winds is avoiding. There will be a height that it's not affected. So then we need to study this height. Professor Paulo Zanetti must have presented that to you. And this will be well crude number here because it is a 1.5 plus a building height plus L. Uh, height plus 1.5 L. So then we have the this height crudely is 2.5 the height of the building. We use that as uh, height of the building. Okay, this this height here in general. Now let me just do this. I'm just introduce you to a general concepts, and you can see that. This is US EPA with modeling a wind tunnel. So they release and there is turbulence. And if you take a picture with a, with a flash, the plume was like this, but it keeps on oscillating. But if you leave the shutter open for 10 minutes, the plume that leaves on the shutter is this. And the concentration is Gaussian, okay? It's important to know because when we talk about Air mod and cow path, some people get the wrong idea, path models in general. So I introduce now a evaluation of different models. I focus mainly path versus plume, but I'll talk about all the models. So you do not need to know the equation, but here you can see the equation, forget about it. This is the emission rate, don't worry about it, the Q. This is the dispersion on the crosswind on the vertical. This is the wind speed, okay? Important to know this one. Now, where is the variable time here? We don't have it. So a Gaussian plume model is a steady state model. It also has some deficiencies. If the wind goes to zero, concentration goes to infinity. So it cannot be zero, but it has a problem as well that if it is too small, even if it's not zero, concentration is so high, it's higher than when it left the stack. So it no longer conserves mass. So very important for you to understand that. So one thing that calcium plume models cannot do is calm hours, okay? So don't worry about the equation. That's the point I wanted to make here. So they have limitations. They are straight line models, so instantaneous like this. And we know minimum of 10 minutes. I'm doing here 15, just a uh, lot of experiments in 15. And then they'll be Gaussian straight line, so it cannot do curves. Another problem is this. If the wind here, right here, is 10 kilometers per hour, and I have receptors to 50 kilometers, you shouldn't use a plume model beyond 50 kilometers. I have receptors all the way and it's 10 kilometers per hour. I start emitting here, beginning of hour one. After one hour, how how far do you think air mod will compute concentration? 
everybody thinks 10 kilometers because it's, but it's a steady state model has no idea of time. In that one hour, it will compute to 50 kilometers. And that's not feasible, but that's what it does. Now, it cannot support calm hours. We saw why, what's the reason? And it's a single wind field. So if I have 10 kilometers per hour here, and at this location here, I could have another MET station saying the wind at this location is this way. I cannot use that MET station. I can only use one MET station, not the limitation. Now you may think, oh, AirMod then is a bad model. No, AirMod is an excellent model. There is something called stochastic models, Monte Carlo models. You use a simpler model and you run it multiple times. You do many realizations. And then that simpler model, when we run, it will give results equivalent to a much more sophisticated model. So air mod, I tell that to everybody, I wrote a paper about it, is a stochastic model. Although it has these limitations for a regulatory agency, it is fantastic because when we measure concentrations and we compare against air mod, let's say this is a center line, and if the models agree 100%, I will not explain uh, QQ plots here. I just need to explain this. If the models are exactly what the measurements are, measurements are not, not perfect, models are not perfect. Let's assume they are. All the points should align on this 45 degree line because he is measured and here are simulated with models. They're perfectly aligned here, but they will not align. But air mod is so good that it will not allow numbers that will not be measured. So if air mod says the maximums are over here, let's say, the measurements will never be higher than, well, there are exceptions, but they will 99.9% .9 of the time will not be higher than air mod says. So for regulatory purposes, air mod is an outstanding model. Okay, so it's very important for you to understand that. I'm not here to talk bad about air mod or cow path. Both are great models, but when using models, you must know the limitations, and the limitations are presented here, and still a good model. Let me give you an example here. This is a three-dimensional plume, a three-dimensional plume that we generated with air mod. Uh, air mod view that we have internally can do this. The wind, the mat station is behind these mountains. So in reality, the mountains here deflect this and it goes through the valley and the plume should exit through the valley there, it doesn't. So it cannot change direction. So the wind for is a single wind field. So this facility here, and this is a real situation. So this facility here, is in, in a valley and it doesn't do the job here. So Kalpak can do this, the release the plume will travel through there, okay? But still it's an outstanding model. Now, how does a path model like Kalpak or ski path, ski cam work? Well, if you have the blue behind is air, a plume model like air mod and the red one is a path model like Kalpa. And then in one hour, I release, I can release paths at different rates per hour. But for my example, I'm releasing 60 paths per hour, one path every minute. So I release the path at hour one and the wind is 10 kilometers per hour. So the path, the center of the path will travel to 10 kilometers and it stops. The next path will travel and it will stop and the one and so on and so forth. Okay. Now the next hour, this is the same location, but it is like you are in a, a comic book strip. So this is next time. So what happened is, let's say in meeting that hour, one ton, just my example, 
one ton of SO2. Now, next our air mod or a pool mod forgets about that tonnage of SO2. So it's emit as if it was emitting this direction for a whole year. It has no idea, it's steady state, no idea about time. The path model, it still has, the path still exists, that mass of SO2 still is accounted for. Now start displacing this, this way, okay? That's how it behaves. Now, a path model, it released these small cylinders. I don't have time to explain why they are cylinder. Well, let me explain. Calpath is actually Misopath 3 or Misopath 4. Uh, it was developed by two professors at MIT in 1977. And then they had Misopath 2 and updates. And basically, in 1977, they said, we do not know, we know how to compute sigma y, and we know how to compute sigma z, the vertical one, the dispersion, the coefficient. Remember the width of a plume here, this is 4.3, and let's say it's horizontal sigma y. Okay, that's the width of the plume. So they did not know what to do with the sigma x. So they say, oh, just temporarily in a few months, we find how to compute it. So in this 46 years later, we still have sigma x equals sigma y. That's why it's a circle at the top here, my cylinder. So release this tiny cylinder and it travels and the dark is because it's high concentration. And it travels, then ambient air mixes. It increases the volume for the same mass of pollutants, bigger volume, lower concentration. It travels farther, more mixing of ambient air, expands the volume, lowers the concentration. Now, because it's a cylinder, it has a problem. This is the ground level, and this is the vertical wind profile. So that's why when we say met station, I have to say what is the anemometer height, because if the anemometer was this height here, this is the for a taller anemometer, the wind is faster and faster a problem for the path because at the bottom I have wind speed is slower and at the top farther. This shears the path. To mitigate the problem, the path travels with the velocity of the center of the path, this velocity here, for example, okay? Now it has many benefits. It supports calm hours because when we have calm hours, the path just doesn't move, but it still exists. It uses simple, very simple. This is very important if you use Calpath to understand that it's a diagnostic wind field. I show in a longer course that it is basically an extrapolator, extrapolates everything. It doesn't use, it doesn't solve the Navier-Stokes equations. The only thing it does is mass conservation. Everything else is, uh, let's say, waving of hands almost, okay? But remember, it was a model developed. It is, if you look inside, it is the 1977 MISO 5. So 1984, uh, California paid to get some things added to MISO path and call it California path. That's why it's called car path. So it's missed benefits because you can travel farther than the limit of the plume model, so it can go to 300 kilometers. It cannot go for cow path. And the limitation is that, remember, as, as we, the wind is faster and faster as we go up. It is a cylinder. Now, it goes, cow path goes to 300 kilometers. We have a model that instead of having single cylinder, like our path, it has a stack of coins. 
and you see what happens. It is still a cylinder, but it's a flattened cylinder. Here are the coins. And now this coin can travel this velocity and the coin here travels with a lower velocity. And this is a ski path. And you hear about this model called ski cam, which is the ski path with chemistry. It has the photochemistry that we have in C Mac. So we have air mod view, or path view, ski path, ski cam view, because then you can do photochemistry. Calpath does not do chemical transformation, converting uh, ozone, generating and consuming ozone. It doesn't do that. You would have to use KCAM, okay? And here is what I was describing to you, the path limitation. We have it here. And we have a stack of coins. Each coin would go, so that limitation. Some people tell Jesse, there is path splitting Calpath but it is done late. I told uh, Joe Skier, the guy that adapted Misopath into Kalpath, and Skipath was doing much better in an EPA presentation. He was furious because they showed that Skipath was doing much better. And he said, no, you did all wrong, etc." cetera. I had a, uh, it was ugly. And then when I was leaving, I said, look, just split the path every hour. He did, and then I was matching results with skip path. Uh, he went uh, there, generated this, generated the study, never told anybody I taught him that. Anyway, so here I'm just showing that there is also the wind as it goes up, it also turns to the right, okay? It turns to the right. In the northern hemisphere, it turns to the left. In a longer course, I teach you why that happens. And why, and I show this because the swing sock. When I was a kid, my father took me to an air show and I, was, I my head, I was like a shock. I was seeing the wind sock blowing this way and the clouds, they were blowing twisting to the right. And I was really shocked. I said, something's wrong here. And I, I couldn't uh, grasp. Later on, I learned why. Now, this is a wind flow from Kalpath. This is actually from Kalpath view. You can see that winds at the lower level, is this red one here, the, the green one. As you go up, it turns to the right. And now when we have terrain, terrain acts as a break. Uh, I'm, I'm being very crude here, simplifying the presentation. So X as a break on the wind. So the wind here is at a lower speed than when it's flat. It's a higher speed over here, okay? Now an advantage, I did the synthetic wind for Kalpath. You can see that it will only move the pollutants in the first hour to this position. If it was, uh, Air mod, it would have concentration expanding all the way over here. By the way, one thing that I did not explain when we have the cylinders is that I have the plume, I had this, and I had the uh, path, the cylinders like exactly matching the air mod run. And this is because the Kalpath development team copied the calculations of the sigma y and sigma z from air mod. So then obviously, let's say it travels one kilometer, computes the sigma y and sigma z, they will be the same. There are certain exceptions because of surface properties here the albedo, bone ratio, surface roughness. But let's say conditions being the same, they'll be exactly the same because they use exactly, copy the subroutines in Fortran from air mod into Kalpath, okay? So they will be the same. Now, then air mod would compute, which is not feasible. This is correct for the path model, but air mod will compute all the way 
to the end of the modeling domain because it has receptors over here, okay? Now, air mod will also, when I do the next, I will vary this by 30 degrees. I created this wind synthetic wind field to demonstrate. And this is in Kalpak. Then the next hour, it will forget about all the kilograms of pollutants emitted this way. And air mod will draw another one all the way to the end here. This doesn't happen with a path model like Kalpak and Skipa. Skip path, by the way, can go like to 2,000 kilometers. There are notes that I can make here, but in order to uh, save time, I'm going to present this, okay? Now, there are other models that we could be using. And in Germany, it's this Austal view. Situation is this, let's say I have The wind, I told you this many times, faster here, slower here. So I could use, instead of using coins or cylinders or a Gaussian plume, I can use tracers. People call it Lagrangian particle model, but in air dispersion model, it confuses people. They think it's particulates, PM10, PM2.5. So I say tracer. And they are real, really tracers. Then you could put the tracers and it will travel with the velocity. It has a big advantage. Let's say I, I am in Manhattan, New York, and I have a street here. Let's say it's the Fifth Avenue. Doesn't matter, it's just my example. And I have buildings besides, right? So the cars are and buses and trucks are trafficking here. Air mod and cow path would disperse through the buildings. They just expand. So the plume will go through the buildings, which makes no sense. Or air mod and cow path. Lagrangian tracer model, like Austal view, we have Austal view, which is Austal 2000. The tracers, they will hit the buildings and bounce back to the street. So this is good for street canyons. It is also good for older because complex situations, it will not disperse and open when we have buildings. It will channel and it generate the wind, the wind and the flow through the buildings and through the streets, okay? So let me give you an example. That's one of the reasons we have a, a supercomputing capacity here at Lakes environmental software. By the way, we are not a consulting company. We are a scientific software company doing work for uh, environmental software. Uh, so we don't compete in the, you go and find us bidding in dispersion modeling projects. We do a few of that because we have 45,000 clients and a main modeler moves to another company or gets sick, they still have to deliver. So instead of giving a competitor to do the runs, they hired us to do the runs for them, okay? But we do not bid in dispersion modeling projects, for example. Now you see air mod, let's say the, there is a big emission over here and it doesn't respect the buildings, air mod and Kalpaf will go and spread as if the buildings don't exist. Uh, our Austal view, the it would go through uh, in between. It will not go through the buildings. It goes in between uh, that configuration. Okay. Now another myth uh, myth that people have is Kalpaf will always generate better results than uh, Air Mod up to three kilometers in general. Air mod will give better results. Uh, it's not the cow path is bad. Let's make that very clear. Cow path is a good model. Air mod is a good model. Now, when I say good or bad, this is actually, remember, I told you this is called a QQ plot, quantile quantile plot. 
And this is, if I get all the measurements and I put in column A in an Excel spreadsheet, and I order from lowest to highest, and I put column B, I put all the model results, and I order from lowest to highest, and I generate a XY plot. And then if they were perfect, all the measurements would be aligned here. So this is a measure how good it stays with, uh, with the observe, how it compares. So it's a good statistical tool. Now, you can see here that air mod, the blue one, is doing a better job very close to the 45 degree line here than Kalpath is. And the reason is, let's say this is a stack. Can you see it from there? I hope you can. And then I release the puffs. So I release tiny ones, the wind carries, I then, and then if you look over time, you will have a series of puffs like that. And they're bigger. Now you see there are gaps in between them here. When they start uh, being together like this, they start outperforming air mod against measurements. They produce close results, okay? About up to three kilometers, which it would be uh, around here. Then against measurements, air mod usually outperforms Kalpath. Beyond three kilometers, Kalpath more often than not will outperform air mod. So at the end of the day, it's a balance between air mod, a Kalpath, or a simpler mod and a more complex mod. Uh, you go and use air mod where it works. It, it, it runs much faster. I ran for the same case, obtained similar concentrations using air mod for the same case, using Kalpath and using Alstal. Use air mod view, Kalpath view, and Alstal view. And they give similar, very similar, very close results. But air mod took for to run one year to two minutes. Kalpath took 40 minutes. Alstal took 80 hours, not minutes, hours. So they take longer, they're more complex to do. I'll stop here and I'll do a model demo. So I'll, I'll let me stop this. Stop here. And let me bring air mod. Before I do that, let me bring uh, Google Earth. So I usually find squares or places that I can put a stack and doesn't offend anybody because I don't know the location. I don't put on top of churches or mosques or whatever, national symbols. So because of Paolo Zanetti from Italy, I'm going to put in the Coliseum. So what I'll do here, I get the coordinates. And I hope you guys know what is uh, UTM coordinates by now. And um, I have it here. One second. It's, I have two screens, I have to bring this one. So I have these coordinates. I have a UTM zone, 33, and I have a X and Y, east and north, okay? So I will create on this side. So this is, I'm going to use air mod view. Uh, here's the team. And then I'm going to create a new project. I will create this project. Let me do this on Corsair mod. I'll go create on this one here. That's a Paolo example. Next. We create wizards because then it's much easier for you to 
uh, know how to run a program. I hate Adobe products that I have to come on the top here. And then the first thing is go to the 10th of these options and it's the fifth from top to bottom. Now the next step is on the fourth here and it's the sixth. How do, how do you know what's the next step? That's silly. So you the projection will be UTM. The UTM zone we already saw is UTM zone 33. That's in the Northern hemisphere. That's the default for us. And now I'll copy that and put it here. And I'll copy this. Don't copy the number, the letters, because then Air Mode will not accept the, when you try to insert. And I'll get it over here. That's the other. Put it here. And let's say we're going to do 10 kilometers. And what we are going to do, I always request that you check because I could have goofed in the UTM zone or I have could have goofed in a digit. If I miss a digit here, I'll be like almost almost 3,000 miles away, no, 2,500 miles, 4,000 kilometers, okay? So click check. You see what it's doing? It is the right location and it's putting this modeling domain box here. So this is what I'm going to model now, okay? So I'm done with this. I'll minimize this for now. And then I can say finish. And now I have the map. I can even download satellite map. I can have both at the same time. They have advantages. So download more maps. We don't get this from Google map. We pay directly to satellite companies. Google does the same thing. That's why we we say set up, uh, Lake Satellite because they say Google Earth. Uh, it's it's fine, and has advantages because I can. I have both of them. This one doesn't have the street names, but this one has the pictures. So what I can do is. I come here and I can make it more transparent. And now I have the satellite pictures with the names, you see? So I got the uh, best of both maps. So I'm, I said, I'm going to put a stack here and I'll put it right at the center. Base elevation, I can say a zero for my example, release height, let's say it's a hundred meters. Emission rate, let's say it's a hundred. Exit temperature, say, Four, four, four. My finger is on the four, so I'll do stack four. Exit velocity for four. Okay. So I'll run. I can say, now I'm almost ready to run. What I need to do is insert the grid and give the met, met, meteorological data for this site. So I can zoom out over here. And I can put a grid. I can discuss more, but we don't have time. Uh, what I need to do with these grids, everything is introductory, okay? I can come to the mat and I look for, enter, this is a symbol, universal symbol to say, give me a file. So I'll go here, go to the mat. Oops, go on this other one then. The mat. The model is smart enough that it knows there's another PFL there, it gets it. Base elevation for my quick example, zero. So now I'm ready to run. I'll say run, air mod. I don't have a building. There are warnings as for the elevation. The warning, if I go in the details, say, you know, it's 
We set elevation at zero, verify, it's just this warning. And then I say run. I say run with whatever I have. I start running, you're done. I can do that in under five minutes. It's taking a little longer because I'm uh, running parallel and it's setting up the parallel. Next runs, it would be very, very fast. It's taking too long to bring the parallel. One second. Yeah, we'll cancel the run. File. References. I'm using this MPI, which is parallel. I can use the non-parallel one. Run, come on. The parallel will run, let's say this computer I'm running has 16, my desktop has 16 processors. It will run exactly 16 times faster. Output file, something failed, go to the end. Oh yes. It's complaining about the the mat. I, I use another mat data. Okay. Anyway, that's it. I'll stop here because we have the question and answer. So just to uh, create the model, minimize this, and I'll stop share. All right, guys, I'm at your service. Uh, I, either, I was either very clear or I put everybody to sleep because there are no questions. Very good. Any 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 question on the on the presentation? And by the way, just to clarify, uh, Jesse has presented uh, his own uh, his company's uh, uh, user friendly version of uh, AirMod, uh, which is uh, provided by his company and can save a lot of time in comparison to the official free version that you can obtain from the EPA. So again, any question? Uh, for me, no, thank you. Okay, very good. Well, Jesse, thanks again. This was very useful. I will I will continue to expand uh, during the course uh, the concept of Gaussian plume model and Gaussian path model. So I'll, I will add uh, more things. Uh, and uh, we will uh, we will reconvene in ten minutes. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, have a nice course. Thank you, Paulo, for everything. And uh, guys, you're in good hands. Paulo is uh, an outstanding uh, speaker and has a deep knowledge on all the topics he deals with. Great. Thanks again, Jesse. Bye bye. Very good. Is eight o'clock my time? <clears throat> And we are ready to start our third uh, seminar today with uh, uh, the guest speaker, Dr. Frank Friedman, um, is uh, a, a person I collaborate on a daily basis for uh, uh, friendship and consulting. And uh, 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 Frank has been working on uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, air pollution and meteorology for at least 30 years, I believe. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a certified consulting meteorologist uh, um, and uh, uh, will present today a discussion on modeling of plumes from fires. So Frank, you, you, can share, you can share oh, your, yeah. your screen. Okay, well, am I coming in loud and clear on the very, audio? Very clear. Okay, good. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the workshop here, and I'm happy to discuss with you all fire 
modeling of um, you know pollution from fires and things. Let's um, and then thank you, Paolo, for the very nice introduction as well, of course. And let me just share screen, like you said, and get to my slides. Okay. Screen. I'm sorry. I got to get rid of a little bit of interference from the Zoom here. I'm sorry. Let me. I'm just trying to get oriented. The Zoom. Trying to lose that. Okay, that's better. Okay. Okay. So we can get started um, right now. And um, thank you again for attending. And the title of the um, presentation here is Fire Plume Modeling. Um, like Paolo mentioned, I'm Frank Friedman. Uh, I work at Envirocomp. Um, with Paolo and yes, with um, friendship tacked on, um, of course, like you mentioned. And I'm also associated with San Jose State University Department of Meteorology and Climate Sciences. And um, both of these I've been associated with for like 20 to 30 years now. So a background in air pollution modeling, a background in computational fluid dynamics, turbulence, um, fluid dynamics in general, and all of the things that go along with that when we're solving consulting problems in these fields. So um, I've, over the years, I've had a, um, I've branched out into a lot of different things, fortunately, because it's always nice to learn. Okay, so um, to just as a pictorial here of the distinctions that we're going to be highlighting between fires and typical industrial plumes that come out of, for example, smokestacks. So on the left here is a typical industrial plume that comes from a, a smokestack. And on the right is a industrial fire that happens somewhere. And um, just visually, one can easily see a lot of differences here, but I'll highlight a few that I wanna, um, like I said, highlight. The first is the size, of course. The, the fire here on the right, um, the dispersion associated with that generally covers a larger region than what might one might be considering with a single industrial stack. So this, this just the general scale of the plume is different. The second thing, and this is what we'll really highlight in this talk, is the plume rise. From on the left here, you see the industrial plumes generally um, they are hot or, and have momentum um, different than ambient soon after the release, but you know, pretty soon after, you know, as you get as the plume gets higher in the sky, there's enough entrainment with the ambient air so that it loses that momentum and then just moves with the ambient wind. Whereas with a fire, it's so hot that the buoyancy from the release um, doesn't get entrained out from the ambient air pretty much through the whole rise through the boundary layer. So that you get a pretty intense plume rise with a fire that you don't generally see with industrial plumes. So much so that with fires, the plume can actually penetrate the um, top of the atmospheric boundary layer. And we get a problem of well, how much of this plume mass gets into the boundary, above the boundary layer rather, and doesn't then get mixed down to the surface. It's so hot, it can rise in above the boundary layer. So um, these are considerations one has to take into account when you look at fires versus industrial plumes. Gaussian models for industrial plumes, and you'd have to modify that or use a different type of model for fires. Okay, so let's go and see what the outline of the talk is. Part one will give some background, um, more um, photos and diagrams of fires to kind of distinguish that from typical modeling of um, industrial plumes. Um, some of the basic inputs and parameters that one needs to account for and consider when you're setting up a fire model. And then the modeling strat goals and strategies of what kind of are the desired properties of a fire model, what they're kind of looking for. Okay, so that'll be part one. The next two parts um, are gonna be some tests that I've done as I've learned more about fire models and how to apply them for two different types of models. One is this computational fluid dynamics model, which is a, um, a runs directly off the three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations where you set up a three-dimensional grid. And these are very um, advanced models. And we're gonna be doing CFD modeling using the FDS fire dynamics simulator. That's what FDS stands for. 
And uh, I'll get more into the details of that as we get to that part. So there'll be a description and then two test cases of the CFD model for a neutral atmospheric stability and stable atmospheric stability. So we could see how the directly simulated plume from a fire by the CFD approach changes as we change the atmospheric stability, looking at such things as how the plume rises, how it disperses, how it um, how much mixes down to the surface for different atmospheric stabilities. And then if we have time, um, most of the, the slides I have for this are the se second part, but I do have some results for a third model, which is a Gaussian model that has been adapted for fires um, to account for the different plume rise dynamics with fires. That model is called Buoyant. It's out of the, um, the Finnish Meteorological Society. Um, and it's a non-CFD model. It's an adapted Gaussian model. And um, I'll do a test case to test how much of the fire plume resides in the ABL and how much gets above the boundary layer. You can set up this model to do an initial test case of that. And this was the first thing I applied the model to as I've learned about how to use that model. Okay, so let's move forward here and go through the background part of the presentation. So again, large industrial fires, just to look at a few more diagrams here. So um, on the left here is a kind of a vertical snapshot. And I just pulled these as stock photos off the internet. Um, so nothing, no personal association with these fires. I don't know where these are or anywhere, but the on the left is, uh, you can see the vertical, you can see the plume rise going kind of straight up. Not a, It's just pretty hot and then rising straight up, a little bit of bending with the ambient wind, but you really are looking at a hot plume rising up. So that we call, that's the plume rise, plume buoyancy. And um, that's another kind of technical term. We want to know how much how buoyant the plume is and how much entrainment of clean air gets into this plume that'll eventually cool that plume. So it does eventually, the plume rise does stop. So entrainment's a term that we use in meteorology that talks about how much clean air gets into the dirty air. So entraining clean air and detraining dirty air. That's the terminology. And also, you can see this, it's black here. So we talk about different constituents in the fire. Obviously, the carbon dioxide might be important from a climate consideration. It's also a good tracer of the fire because most of the plume constituent is carbon dioxide um, that's non-ambient. And then we also, but from the more practical um, importance of the smoke, the trace metals, and other things that might be in there from a pollution impact point of view. On the right here, um, you can kind of see the aerial extent of the of a fire it has it's a big um, area compared to one might be one might consider with a smokestack you want to look at things as heat and mass flux the, the amount per unit area coming off the fire these are important parameters when setting up emissions or setting up a model and that leads the heat flux leads directly to the buoyancy flux which is what then factors into the plume rise and that's the heat release rate um, or the amount of heat generated per unit area by the fire times the area of the release. That'll be the buoyancy flux. So these are just the kind of the, the parameters, just they have a sense of what, you know, what is quantitative measures we need to do to, quanti to model the fire eventually in the models. Okay. The other thing, like I mentioned with large industrial fires is the question of how much a plume rise um, it gets um, through the atmospheric boundary layer. You can see kind of a this kind of anvil shaped um, pattern with the plume here. And where my mouse is kind of spanning horizontally is maybe the top of the boundary layer. And the plume is so hot, it's rising above that. A lot of it gets trapped in the inversion, capping the boundary layer. So we look at things as plume rise through the boundary layer and the penetration through the inversion, capping the boundary layer. Other things we have to consider. And stop me anytime if you have any questions, of course. I can definitely answer things along the way. Okay, moving forward here. So these are just some diagrams I was able to pull from a journal article that is um, the, 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 the base article for the buoyant dispersion model that I'm gonna show later, Kukkonen 22, and there's some other papers by this authoring group about the model. But there are some good diagrams that kind of map out how a fire looks from a, how we might approach it from a modeling point of view. So, and that's what we're showing here is that if you were to look at a fire and try to think, okay, well, how do we think of it in terms of 
processes and modeling, you might think of a source term, which is where the emissions are happening and where the combustion is happening, the pyrolysis, all of the physics of going from a solid um, substance that's burning to the vaporization of that through the pyrolysis to the combustion of those vapors and how that all those processes and those that the detail of how one might model that could be quite sophisticated or it could be highly parameterized depending on the model. So that's then one has to kind of consider this what we call the source term. Second part of a model is the buoyant plume. And this is where the plume rise is happening and where we all that we're talking about of the hot plume rising through the boundary layer and how much entrainment of clean air gets into the plume that can reduce the heat of the plume as it rises and ultimately modify the plume rise as it rises up. Eventually the fire will cool down to the point where it's not hotter than ambient air. And at that point, we're just modeling the dispersion as anything else, uh, ba our basic passive atmospheric dispersion equations that are in our typical Gaussian models, or if the plume has spread to be big enough to encompass maybe a large grid, um, you, might, you might use a grid model at that point, depending on the scale of what you're modeling. So, but from a physics point of view, the, where the emissions are occurring, where the plume rise is occurring, and then eventually it gets um, to be passive and then you model it as any dispersion. A little bit more, this diagram shows a bit more of the details that you might consider. The burning region is where the source is. I want to talk about airflow getting into the burning region. The CFD model, which is the more sophisticated models can get some of these secondary circulations into the fire. So I wanted to just show this diagram at least to point out that. And then again, you have the ambient wind, the buoyant plume like we talked about, and then the passive parts where they, they do distinguish here between two different kinds of passive models, Gaussian models and K-theory models, K-theory models being grid models that I talked about before that are more larger scale. And then also to point out that the other things that one might consider with fires are the particles and the deposition onto the surface. So there's more, a little more sophistication shown in this diagram, also shown as the top of the atmospheric boundary layer, where in this case, they show a diagram where not much gets above the boundary layer, but that may not be the case depending on how hot the fire is, of course. Okay. Some of the basic inputs and parameters that one has to consider when setting up a fire model, the heat and mass release rate. And as I talked about earlier, especially the heat release rate, this is going to factor directly into the buoyancy of the fire that one then that has to then get into the model and determine how high the plume rises. So there's some math here. We'll just kind of walk through this stuff. QHC is the heat release rate. That's in kilowatts or kilojoules per second. So, um, and that's the multiple multiple of the heat of combustion of whatever is burning. And you can look these up in tables and there's and different substances that have different heats of combustion. And then you multiply that by the mass rate of the fuel that's of being burned. So the heat of combustion is the energy per mass and the and M fuel here is the mass flow rate, which is mass per time. So when you multiply that, you get energy per time and the, uh, heat release rate. So you definitely know, you got to know what's burning. You got to know at what rate it's burning. The heat of combustions can be looked up, but you have to know what's burning. And the, ma the mass flow rate, this has, this and requires um, some expertise in combustion and pyrolysis that um, usually a, a modeling team would have to employ someone who has that kind of expertise to determine it if it hasn't been given to you by upstream in your workflow, you know, by someone else, for example. Okay, so that's the base, one of the basic equations. Here's a, a table I was able to pull from this journal article that shows a little bit more of kind of the lookup tables of where you might get certain parameters. And this is for an example for a pool fire. A pool fire is, is just imagine just a, what it just kind of, it has, as it's called, a pool of, fuel that's burning, maybe a, a, a tank, um, a controlled kind of um, spill of some sort. Those are usually models that we call pools. You see different materials that could be in the combusted uh, substance, different hydrocarbons, liquefied natural gas, liquefied petroleum gas. All of these have different heats of combustion and you can see kind of, you one can look up those things. And some of the other things here are just worth noting. 
QM infinity is just a parameter that one can use to get the, um, the mass flow rate. It's the mass release rate for an infinite diameter pool. The mass per unit area per time, it, one, that can be used in models to get the mass flow rate, um, depending on the model you use. Don't worry about this K-beta. That's just a parameter in one of the models they use in the paper. And the other thing I want to point out is the yield. So if you're interested in constituents burned, you want to know the mass of what that constituent per unit mass of fuel burned. And you can look these things up as well. So we got it for carbon dioxide. And you notice it's bigger than one because it's factoring the oxygen from the air that's coming in. So the mass amount of carbon dioxide per unit fuel burn is actually greater than one because you're pulling in mass from outside. But then there's other constituents as well for carbon monoxide, if you're interested in that, for total hydrocarbons, and for smoke itself, the particles. So the, you need to know the yields if you want to model the constituents, but also on the, the two left columns here for different fuels of the heats of combustion and the something you can use for the mass flow rate. So just these things can be gotten. It just takes a little bit of fishing around, and you got to know what kind of fire you got and what's burning. Okay, so some of the basic input parameters for meteor meteorology one might consider for dispersion, the wind speed, the atmospheric stability, and that kind of tells you if, if it's um, we're in a daytime or nighttime situation, and um, meteorologically stability affects dispersion, you know, and boundary layer depth and the height of the inversion base, and the atmospheric lapse rate above the boundary layer, how the temperature changes with height above the boundary layer. Both of these last two bullets are going to affect what happens once the plume penetrates into the inversion and how much disperses and maybe kind of can mix out of the inversion. So these, these are important dispersion parameters that usually get fed into fire models. If you're interested in chemistry, deposition, and particle formation, you might be also considering things as humidity and precipitation. Okay. Let me just take a quick look at the time, making sure I'm on time track. I'm see I'm pretty good. Okay. All right, so that's the, hopefully that's enough background on what we kind of are. Oh, wait, there's one more slide here. Yeah, sorry, it's okay. Desi desired features in a fire dispersion model. This is one more before I get into showing some examples of fire model results. Um, we want something simple but effective, simple but effective inputs to characterize the source, okay? And we talk about the source characterization and how complex it could be to characterize how much and what's being emitted by the fire and the heat that's being released. So these, if in a fire model, you, it's desirable to have a constrained model with not too many inputs, but are complete enough so that we can properly characterize the emission. And that has to do with the mass that's released, the heat that's released, and the constituents that's being burned. Secondly, we want proper handling of plume rise, the enhanced buoyancy due to the heat of the fire, the entrainment of the ambient air into the rising fire plume. And um, so these are things that the computational flight fluid dynamics approach, since it's based directly on the Navier-Stokes equation, directly simulates. Plume models, on the other hand, must parameterize these two effects. So there you can go either way. And fortunately, I have, you know, there's, demonstration here of two different types of models that one is a CFD model, the other is a plume model. Um, depending on the scale of what you're modeling and other things that one might consider, you might choose one approach to the other. So we'll see a little bit of both of those. Finally, for CFD, if you, especially if you're into the near, what we call the near field of the plume, the, the actual the fire itself can be so hot that it can affect the flow itself not just through the buoyancy, but from induced horizontal circulations that feed into the fire. And on one of the previous diagrams I showed, I saw there was like a pictorial of this. So if you're interested in these real fine scale circulation details caused by the fires um, due to the buoyant convections, you need a CFD model for that, okay? So just to kind of spell out, depending on the complexity of the model, what kind of model you might go with, all right. So the two types of the options for models are computational fluid dynamics, like I talked about, and the Gaussian dispersion models. We'll show results for the CFD approach through the FDS model. Here's a link for that. And, um, and you know, these slides will be made available, I assume, so you guys can have access to all this information. 
and uh, let me know if, uh, if, if um, there's any other information you want aside from the slides, just feel free to contact me and I can help you out. Um, and the, so the CFD model full 3D simulations, I'm sorry, full 3D solutions to the Navier-Stokes equation, full, the, CF, the FDS model has a full suite of embedded models for fire physical processes, pyrolysis, combustion, phase change, chemistry, and it's for what we call the near field within one kilometer of the source. The CFD approach is computationally, um, the computational requirements of CFD are such that you need to constrain the domain to something close to the fire, maybe within one kilometer. You start to exhaust computational resources as you make it too big. And also you start to exhaust kind of the input capabilities of the meteorology that can usually feed into a CFD model if you make the domain too big. So these are good things that just has to keep in mind when you're using CFD. The second model, the galaxy dispersion models for fire, the buoyant model, here's a link for that, is a steady state model with an embedded fire plumerize model. And it, you might use that for the far field beyond one kilometer. Okay, let's see here. Here's a, just a diagram of what I need my near field and far field. So just a little, if you might, might, might put a red box around this area close to a fire and call that the near field where you might use CFD. Far field is when you start to get out where the plume has hit amb ambient um, conditions. The plumerize has been mixed out and it's dispersing just with the normal wind flow. There you might want to have a far field model so that you can blend the fire into the ambient air and disperse it according to ambient relationships properly. CFD models usually aren't equipped for that as well. Okay. So let's move on now and just take um, the part two of our um, talk here about the CFD modeling using CFDS. Take a quick look here. For the near field. A few more bullets on FDS here. It's, it's from the um, U.S. National Institutes of Standard and Technology, NIST. It's a U.S. agency that's um, really involved in engineering standards and engineering applications of models that are kind of standardized across the US. Um, here's the here's the link for the FDS, CFD, like I talked about, full physics, various physical process, some models and configuration. So you can model more than outdoor fires with FDS. You can model indoor fires, you can model apartment fires, you know, all kinds of different kinds and various complexities you don't have, you can set up a solid fuel and actually simulate the combustion of it directly. And that's, uh, in, or you can just parameterize it in terms of the heat release from the fires and just model it that way. So there's a lot of different ways to configure it. Simulates fire generation spread and the dispersion of reactants and smoke. So it's the, the direct simulation of the fire spread itself and the dispersion of the products of the fire. It operates on a rectangular grid. This is one of the simplifications over more um, what we call um, um, CFD, commercial CFD models that are out there that are really equipped to do any kind of CFD simulations. FDS this is a CFD model equipped for fires. So it, uh, it, it makes a few simplifications over CFD that models that might be commercially available. One of them is the rectangular grid that it operates on. So. Other CFD models have grid generators where you can set up any kind of grid you want, very different, you know, complex geometries and things. Or C and we operate on a rectangular grid with FDS. Okay, just a little things on in, um, window, is it, FDS is a Windows executable, no compilation necessary. It works on a command line interface, so it doesn't have a GUI. So anyone who uses FDS has to have some basic background on working on a command line, usually. If you, anyone who's gone through an engineering department and gone through some modeling background has worked with Linux, for example, and had to run models from the command line. So hopefully that experience is out there and there's enough, you know, in tutorials and things out there so you can get familiar with that if you're not so familiar with command lines. You enter inputs into a text file. It has a, 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 com a, a companion um, software called SmokeView for viewing the output. Okay, so the FDS and smoke view kind of go together. Some, some test runs, grid and fire inputs. 
So I ran FDS on a 25 by 25 by 25 meter resolution over a two by one by one kilometer domain. That's an 80 by 40 by 40 domain. So that's a pretty modest setup. It's not, it runs pretty quick. I think the simulation runs about a half hour for the time period I'm going to be running it for. That I'll show you. A surface pool fire of about 150, 150 meters centered, it kind of in the center of the domain. You'll see some graphics of the output, so you'll get to visualize how I set this up at that point. Um, some of the fire inputs, single step mixing controlled combustion. This is a parameter where you can put in the model to indicate how you want to model the combustion. I set it up for a propane fuel, has a heat release rate of 250 kilowatts per meter squared, um, corresponds to a fuel consumption rate of, of five, well, 0 0.005 kilograms meter squared per second and 10% of the reactants are smoke. So these are some of the things one has to set up in an input file to model the fire. And I'll just go ahead pretty soon and just show you the results. So there's three, two tests I've done. Both have a wind speed of two meters per second. One is a neutral case where the lapse rate in the boundary layer is set to adiabatic. That's a stability class D um, in the Pasquale um, Gifford stability class. But, um, and um, a stable case where the, lap the lapse rate is set to isothermal, which is stability class E and F in Pascal Gifford terms. And we'll show results now comparing the neutral and the stable cases. Okay. And we ran the run, out, the run for four hours. The fire was turned on two hours in the run. So CFD usually requires a spin up period to get the background flow. Um, reaching a sort of an equilibrium and getting a, a typical boundary layer profile in the background CFD flow set up. So we run it for four hours, spin it up for two hours, and then we turn on the fire two hours into the run. And then we, and then the results I'll show you are a, an hour, well, 1200 seconds after the initial turn on of the fire so that the fire then it kind of, kind of equilibrates and then I'll show you some plots towards the end of the simulation and some animations during that time period as the fire is proceeding, the simulated fire is proceeding. Okay, so here's an image of neutral the, a case for the CFD. So what we're looking at here, this, and just ignore this kind of top of this graphic. This is from Smoke View, and I haven't figured out how to make it not look like a compartment. So this, this fire is actually going into an unbounded Bound, um, model top, and to just even though the graphic kind of indicates otherwise, so just kind of ignore that top there. But what this graphic here is the temperature of the plume in shading, and the these black is the smoke itself. So you'll see the what the, the CFD model is able to directly simulate the heat from the fire because it's a CFD model, and it gets the the flame area just above the flame is reaching about 50 to 60 Celsius. And that's um, so it's pretty hot above ambient. And as you rise upwards, this heat gets diffused out because of the entrainment. But it's it's always it's hotter than ambient the whole time. Whoops, let me go back. And so it's rising pretty much straight up, up through the top of the domain. Let's now look at an animation so you can see kind of more the dispersion of it. And so I'm just going to hit enter. And so this is the simulation by CFD of this neutrally. This, this fire through a neutral atmospheric boundary layer. So we'll just kind of stop talking a little bit here as we just watch. And this is progressing in time over the 7,200 seconds or two hours that I simulated the fire for after the initial two hour spin up of the model. Okay. So you see the, the CFD is able to directly simulate a lot of the circulations that the fire causes. In a neutral atmosphere, the heat, there's not any background stability to impede the rise of the fire. So the fire is hot the whole time and rises pretty much straight up and out the top of the boundary layer. You see these eddies and kind of um, hot, these smoky and non-smoky kind of parts of the plume that a Gaussian model won't be able to simulate, but a CFD model will. The other thing I'll just kind of hit again, just to maybe I can 
do this again. It's like it's, uh-oh. Okay, sorry guys, if I didn't crash my presentation. Okay, sorry guys, maybe technical difficulties. Trying to stop this. Okay, hold on, let me, let me. Sorry, get back to it. Go. Okay, so here's the, yeah. So just pretty much straight up and out. Okay, let's move on and look at uh, some of the other images here. This is a snapshot of for the neutral case of the smoke and the wind vectors, the, the, the flow vectors that, and this is for a snapshot, I think towards the end of the simulation, the smoke is in black and you got these little kind of blue arrows and you see that the ambient wind is coming left to right. And then you see how the CFD model directly simulates the plume rise. And you see these straight up kind of hot, um, buoyant updrafts that the fire causes are directly simulated in the core of this fire. As you go outwards, these diffuse out. Eventually, as you go outwards toward the fire downwind, you see that the wind isn't, isn't just immediately going um, horizontal. There's still a lot of upward motion that's being entrained out of the, the fire plume into the air. So the, the, the smoke that's being detrained out of the out of the fire is still rising and getting kind of caught in fire-induced circulations, something the CFD model can directly simulate. Okay, here's the stable case. And you see the snapshot again, this is of temperature and smoke. So now we're moving on the stable and stable atmospheric stability is when the temperature potential temperature increases with height, causes a, a, a impedance of the atmosphere to updrafts based on the background stability. And this is typical of nighttime conditions that might happen. So you see in this case that you get the same thing that close to the fire, a hot plume that's rising, but because of the um, penetration of this hot plume into a stable atmosphere, you get a lot more complexity, a lot more of the plume gets detrained out and stays in the boundary layer. Okay, and so you see a lot more kind of smoke getting out. So let's kind of see again the animation of this and see how this may compare to the neutral case. So again, here's the turning on of the fire and then the, the you see that now the fire is rising, but it's hitting the background stability and not rising as quickly out of the boundary layer, and more of it's staying in the boundary layer because it's being trapped by the stability. That doesn't mean uh, some of it is mixing down the surface, but um, we're going to compare in a second how much of the plume mixes to the surface for the stable versus the neutral case, because for practical purposes, we might be interested in how much of the smoke gets to the surface, because that's where the, imp the important impacts are in terms of human health and things. But you see the circulations of, of be, are, are quite different when it's stable with this trapping of the plume mass within the boundary layer. Again, CFD is directly simulating a lot of the kind of smoky and non-smoky parts of the fire as the um, induced circulations capture different aspects of the flow. Okay, so here is a snapshot of the flow vectors for the stable case to kind of compare with neutral. So you see that you get the plume rise and the hot updrafts, but then like we were talking about, the, the updrafts get impeded by the atmospheric stability so that it doesn't rise as readily out the top of the boundary layer. Some of it does, but much more of it stays within the boundary layer. And you can kind of see this, what happens is you get some of these kind of complex circulations that develop 
as a result of the what happens typically when hot air rises in stable air is you get kind of upward motion, but then impedance, and then some parts then kind of kind of move back down and kind of a wavy kind of eddy kind of circulation pattern. So that you kind of see the smoke kind of as a tracer of that and a lot of these kind of more complex things happening. Okay, so just some visuals again to just show neutral and stable side by side. So the top of the, of the model is at a thousand meters. Like I said, this is an artificial kind of model top. So kind of ignore that this kind of top lid kind of looking of the graphics. Um, smoke visuals at two hours after the fire start, a neutral fire just kind of rises hot straight out of the boundary layer top. State more of the mass of the state in the stable case stays within the boundary layer. Smoke visuals overlaid with temperature. Okay, just to kind of see again the temperature part of it. But again, very interesting that CFD can capture directly the temperature of the plume, which is important for the buoyancy rise of the fire. And the flow vectors between neutral and stable. Neutral, a lot of just kind of rising up and out. Downwind of the fire, you still get some updrafts. With the stable case, you, you, more of the flow goes horizontal and forms some of these eddy kind of induced circulations downwind of the fire. Okay. Um, one other output of FDS is if you input how much of the fire is smoke, you can calculate how much PM 2.5 is in the, in the um, smoke if you also apply a percentage of the smoke that's um, particles less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter, which is what PM 2.5 is. PM 2.5 is the the part of, is the air pollutant associated with smoke that's most and particles that's most commonly regulated across the world. It's the mass of particles less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter is and important for human health because the particle size is small and gets into the lungs. So we're looking at PM 2.5 simulated by FDS versus height. So height is on the vertical axis here going from zero through a thousand um, meters. Um, on the horizontal axes are the PM 2.5 concentrations in micrograms per meter cubed. And on the left is the neutral case. And on the right is the stable case for three different locations downwind of the fire, 150 meters downwind of the fire, 400 meters downwind of the fire in orange, and 650 meters downwind of the fire in gray. So for the neutral case, downwind of the fire close 150 meters, which is near field, you see that the surface impact is, you know, is um, modest, but then a lot of the fire is, is aloft, okay? It's getting detrained out of the main smoke plume into the atmosphere and stays aloft. As you move downwind, more of it gets dispersed laterally and vertically, and the concentrations decrease pretty quickly as you go um, af after that initial burst, 150 meters down to 400, 650 meters. So the dispersion is pretty rapid. For stable, because the of, of the, um, the reduced dispersion in stable conditions, the plume mass doesn't disperse as much out of the fire, and you see a larger concentration aloft, you know, than compared to neutral. So we're going from, you know, 4,000 micrograms per meter cube down to less than 100 and less for neutral, but um, for stable aloft, you still get as much as 1,000 micrograms per meter cubed. The question is how much of this reaches the surface? So we'll look at that comparison now. So this is the ground level PM 2.5. And I think this is at the lowest grid of the CFD model, which I think is 25 meters, if I remember right. So it's not like breathing level surface, but close to the ground. And um, that different, and so on the vertical is PM 2.5. On the horizontal is the downwind distance going from zero down to a thousand meters. The, the surprising thing is you're actually getting more um, pollution impact in terms of PM 2.5 at the surface for neutral compared to stable modestly. So, the, you know, we're not talking about a huge amount of PM 2.5 compared to what's a lot where you're getting hundreds and thousands of micrograms per meter cubed. This is a modest, maybe 10, 20 micrograms per meter cubed. But for neutral, it's a little bit bigger. And this is because 
there's less, more of the plume is able to disperse to the surface for neutral because there's less, there's um, more dispersion, less impedance to the dispersion due to the neutral stability compared to stable, which impedes dispersion to the, spurs, to the surface. So you get a little bit of a more on the ground for neutral in this case. Um, I'm sure these things can depend on a lot of other parameters. And so depending on exactly how the, the situation for a given application, you might get different results and there'll be more testing as we go forward and applying this to more situations. Okay, the, now that's the CFD model. I got a little more time here. Um, we'll just quickly show some results for the, the second type of model, which is a Gaussian plume model adapted for fires. Um, and that's called buoyant. And that's this finished model that I was talking about um, at the beginning of the talk. So let's kind of remind ourselves what, why, why we might use a Gaussian model compared to a CFD model in terms of near versus far field. This is a slide I showed earlier in the presentation. And the near field, as we might use a CFD model, but as the plume mass um, moves further downwind and it, enough entrainment of clean air gets into the plume, so it's dispersing according to ambient conditions, one might then want to transition to a Gaussian model and use a different type of modeling approach since the regional scale of the application is bigger and gets beyond what CFD is really equipped for. So there we use a Gaussian model. And so buoyant is an example of that. And we'll show some results of that now. So the basics of the buoyant model is from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. Here's a link one can look um, get to learn about the model. A steady state Gaussian plume model um, has an embedded fire plume rise model. So this is what makes it distinct, um, distinct from a typical Gaussian model that's based on Briggs plume rise equations for smokestacks. This uses a, a different plume rise model for fires and it's for far field dispersion. Some of the, like I showed you for the CFD model have a, another, type of slide here for similar slide for the installation execution of buoyant. Um, this is a Fortran code. So you have to download the Fortran code and compile it. That's a difference than this FDS CFD model where it's, a, it's already a pre-compiled executable. So um, one needs to have a little bit more technical background on how to compile Fortran codes. And you need to install a Fortran compiler for that reason. Here's a how I did it and just one can definitely you know, hit the internet and um, do some Google searches to learn more about this. I won't spend a lot of time describing it, but MSYS2 is a virtual Linux environment that what can be installed in Windows. And part of the MSYS2 virtual environment is a G4 Fortran compiler. So once you get all that set up, you have the compiler for the Fortran code and the virtual environment to run the model in one, um, one swoop. So it's a command line interface that you run through this virtual environment and use the Fortran compiler to compile the Fortran code. And you enter inputs into a text file once you get everything compiled and set up. And it's text file output, so there's no GUI. So you have to then port the, the results into some kind of graphics program. So yeah, anyway, if, if anyone is running the model, just wants to try this out and has any questions based, and wants to um, compare experiences, definitely hit me up. I can help you out. So the question I'm gonna ask with the model, and this is, I'm just started to run this model. I'm just getting familiar. Not all the capabilities I'm kind of really gotten really good at, but one thing I can do based on the capabilities of me running the model that I have at this point is look at the output and answer a question that came up when we looked at one of these graphics earlier in the talk, which is how much of the plume rise stays within the boundary layer? So here's an industrial fire we looked at before, and it's very hot. It's so hot that it rose into above the boundary layer and stayed in the inversion layer, capping the boundary layer. So a lot of this um, plume didn't reach the surface, and it, it gets trapped and never reaches the surface, really, um, if it's going to stay trapped in the, in the above the boundary layer. So in just we might say, well, how, but there's no way to know just by looking at this picture how much mass this is. But the, this model actually can be run in test cases to answer this question. So we're going to run test cases to check how model predicts this quantity, how much of this plume gets above the boundary layer. Okay, so here's some test runs 
that were done to investigate this. So I, the meteorological inputs, wind speed of 3.22 meters per second, kind of a odd choice based, and this was because I was first ran the model to compare with some test cases that were set up by the developers and they used that wind speed. So I just kept that wind speed. And a neutral boundary layer depth that you input um, at a thousand meters. So that you, you and then above that, you set up a, a um, that's the top of the boundary layer. And, I, and then the, the third input was the lapse rate above the boundary layer of the temperature. And I forgot what I set up, but it's the same for all these three cases. So a thousand meter boundary layer depth, wind speed of 3.22 meters, and then three pool fires that are, are subsequently hotter and have a higher heat release as you go from case one to case two to case three. For case one, it's a, what we call a low heat release rate of 20 kilowatts per meter squared. For case two, a medium heat release of 700 kilowatts per meter squared. And case three is a high heat release rate of 1800 kilowatts per meter squared. And again, the higher the heat release rate, the more buoyancy is in the plume, the hotter it, in the more the hotter it is, the more buoyant it is, the more likely it is to get hit the boundary layer and rise above the boundary layer top. So we'll see, compare how much stays in the boundary layer for a cool, a low, a medium, and a high heat release. So a cool fire, a medium fire, and a hot fire. Just as a reference to what we looked at for the CFD, the heat release rate for that fire was 250 kilowatts per meter squared. So going back to the previous fire, previous slide, 250 kilowatts per meter squared lands the CFD case between the low and the medium cases that I'm gonna show now for buoyant. Okay. So let's go ahead. All I have to show as far as results here is a, is a tabular comparison, no graphics, but we could see um, um, a table here and answering the fraction of the plume that stays in the boundary layer. So the modeling run is in the left column, case one, case two, case three, and the heat release rate is input is in the second column, 20, 700, 1800. And then the route point of the model is on the right here fraction of plume in the boundary layer. So that, what that is, is how much stays in the boundary layer. And then the one minus that is how much rises above the boundary layer. So for the low heat release rate um, um, case is a 55% or about 56% stays in the boundary layer. Okay, so about half goes above the boundary layer, half stays in. For the case two, we're down to close to 20% that stays in the boundary layer and 80% rises above the boundary layer. When you get to the very hot fire, only 5% stays in the boundary layer, 95% rises above the boundary layer. So you can see how the heat release rate is a very important parameter for fires. It's gonna determine a lot of how, the, how much fire stays in the boundary layer, how much ground impact you're gonna have. So getting that right is gonna, is gonna be a big deal in a practical situation. It's in the amount, the way the plume disperses, how much plume rise there is, how much gets above the boundary layer is highly dependent on that. And so those are my three bullet points here. Fraction of in the atmospheric boundary layer is highly sensitive to the fire strength via the heat release. The more plume in the boundary layer, the higher the surface concentration. So that's the practical importance of what we're doing here. And the third thing, the, the, the buoyant model, it's very promising because it appears to capture an observable feature of strong fires that most of the plume mass can stay aloft above the boundary layer. And if I just go back again to this visual here, you can see for a, this, this fire, and I, I, this seems to be a pretty hot fire just based on my intuitive look at that picture. Um, this is a large industrial fire that caused this, um, had, had a lot of news reports and things. A lot of this mass does get above the boundary layer, as you can see there. Okay, so just some basic conclusions here. Um, dispersion modeling for fires. We've shown here two approaches um, that, demonst that demonstrate at, um, alternatives to the typical Gaussian models for smokestacks that have been around for decades. And we've shown initial test results of both of these models that appear to be promising. The first model was the FDS, Computational Fluid Dynamics Model from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Again, refer to previous slides for test results and links to learn more, to download that model, test it, um, get some of the basic 
information on the model. The second model is the buoyant model from the Finnish Institute. It's a steady state Gaussian model that could be used for the far field. The CFD model could be used for the near field. Both result, um, models seem to be doing what they should from a qualitative point of view. I look forward myself to running these more and learning more. And again, if anyone out there wants to correspond to share experiences with you running the model, feel free to do that. And I'm happy to have presented my initial results to you and I can take any questions you have. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Frank, for the Thank excellent you. presentation. We have time for one question. Thank you, Frank, for the presentation. I don't have any questions. Oh, thank you, Paula. Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm, and if yeah, again, if you want to, ever want to get into fire modeling, let me know. We can help you out. We can court share experiences. Great. Very thank good. You. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, and we'll start in ten minutes uh, the final uh, seminar for today. Thank you again. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, Paula. So uh, the last seminar, and we will talk a lot about modeling tomorrow too, but uh, um, let's start here with this presentation. Uh, we are, I already show you this slide, you know, the basic, the basic uh, uh, structure of an air modeling uh, methodology is emission and meteorology for input and concentration for output. And uh, um, be careful about the units because at the beginning people make confusion. The emissions are typically mass over time, like kilogram per second. And emission cause ambient concentrations and ambient concentrations are expressed uh, <clears throat> typically in mass over volume. For example, micrograms per cubic meter. However, most of the time when we measure gases, the measurements are, me are, are done in part per million ppm or part per billions. So in Europe, uh, they prefer always to use metrics uh, <coughs> and therefore express everything in micrograms or nanograms per cubic meter. In America, we prefer to the United States uh, to use the actual units of the measurement, PPM and PPB. And of course, there is conversion between one unit and the others, but uh, sometimes <laughs> the conversion uh, you know, can be tricky. So be careful and be aware that uh, uh, we measure in PPM uh, but if we want to use metrics, we have to convert to micrograms per cubic meters for gases. Okay, so the biggest challenge, well, the biggest, the first challenge when you run an air pollution model is to estimate the emissions. So how do you do that? Uh, the emission rate, the emission parameters and the emission rates. Um, in some cases in my project, I have other people doing the calculation of the emission factors. Uh, I'm not an expert on emissions, but I need emission rates to run my model. So for example, uh, during a, a flaring episodes, uh, where in a flare, in an industrial flare, you burn uh, H2S to transform it into SO2 because uh, SO2 is a bad pollutant, but H2S is even worse. So when you have uh, when you want to get rid of H2S uh, hydrogen sulfide, uh, you send it to a flare, you burn it, and you will produce uh, uh, SO2, uh, which is uh, you know better than H2S. So in this particular case, I had a combustion engineer in my team who made a calculation and from 3 a.m. in the morning to 1 p.m. in the afternoon, 
he did all the mass balance, the combustion equation, and he was able to give me all this emission rate minute by minute uh, for H2S and SO2. And so I had the number to use in my model. Uh, in other situation, I have uh, um, I have agencies like in this case, uh, in this huge uh, release uh, accident. Maybe you heard about it. Uh, this was uh, a major leak of methane in an area near Los Angeles. Uh, the agencies did all the work to calculate the emission rate every day, every hour for the entire period of uh, concern. So um, that's, a, that's the first challenge you have when you do modeling to calculate the emission rate. Um, something to keep in mind is the US EPA AP42. These are hundreds and hundreds of, well, I say thousands of pages of document, AP42, that have uh, um, that have uh, if any type of in, of um, industrial activities. Um, you see a list here. I'm not going to read it. Any type of industrial activity has some sort of emission estimate provided in this huge set of AP42 documents. So remember, this is an important resource that you can use in the future. So let's assume that your emissions are given to you or calculated by you or by your team. And then uh, the second input is the meteorology. And fortunately, meteorological data are available throughout the world, mostly at airport, but also at um, uh, industrial station or, or um, other station that are available uh, and are easy to download from the internet. So, and there are companies specialized like, like uh, uh, Jesse has, is the president of Lakes Environmental and there are other company too. They will provide you meteorological data anywhere in the world in a format ready to run for models. So you don't have to struggle with that. You pay a few hundred dollars and this company will provide you with all the meteorological data ready to use is is really um I, I i i really recommend that uh so you have the emissions you have the meteorology and you can run your models which model do you run well the most common model as you already know from other presentation is the gaussian model and in particular the gaussian plume model uh, Jesse already showed you this idea that uh, an instantaneous plume may be very um, complex and may have a very irregular concentration inside the plume. But by the time you take an average, typically you have a bell shape concentration in other words imagine that you are you have a drone taking a picture of a plume from above so this is the picture of your plume from above so this is x and y instantaneous picture is this the concentration is this if you take a uh, hundred pictures over an hour and then you take the average of the concentration, in general, in general, you have a bell-shaped curve, and a bell-shaped curve can be approximated by a Gaussian distribution. I'm sure that many of you have already encountered the Gaussian distribution in statistics. The Gaussian distribution is very common in statistical analysis, and the, the type of this type of distribution is uh, um, the beauty of the Gaussian distribution is that it can be fully characterized 
from minus infinity to plus infinity by only one parameter, sigma, the standard deviation. With one number, I describe the entire distribution from minus infinity to plus infinity, one number. is the simplest distribution imaginable, and it fits a lot of situation. Um, let me show you. Uh, there is a long list of uh, situation here. There are only nine real life example of normal or normal mean Gaussian distribution. Uh, <laughs> for example, um, for example, the height. You check, you do a statistics of the heights of different people. And if you have enough people, like a few hundred, you will find that it can be approximated by a Gaussian distribution. Rolling a dice, you have a Gaussian distribution or something that can be approximated by a Gaussian distribution. Tossing a coin, uh, the uh, ID, IQ, sorry. You test the IQ of 200 people and you will find a you will find extremely intelligent people that are maybe 1% of the population and uh, and vice versa, very people with very limited intelligence uh, at uh, uh, at the other side of the curve. It's, uh, and, and I'm going to stop here. I could go on and on and on. You find the Gaussian distribution or normal distribution everywhere in, uh, in, uh, in the normal world. And um, the Gaussian distribution can be described by a simple equation. As I told you, only one parameter, because typically the average is zero. So it, this is the formula. I'm sure you have seen it before. This is the formula. Sigma is the standard deviation. E, of course, is the exponential. Mu is the average we can set up mu equals zero. So the entire distribution is described by one and only one parameter, sigma. 68% of the distribution is between minus one and plus one sigma. 95% is between minus two sigma and plus two sigma. And almost 100%, almost 99.7% is between minus 3 sigma and plus 3 sigma. Please no note then this distribution never go to zero. The value go extremely low. They become infinitesimal, but they never go to zero. So how do I apply the Gaussian distribution that most people have studied only in statistics. How do, how do I apply this formula to the Gaussian plume? Well, it's very simple, very simple. My basic assumption in the Gaussian plume model is that if we look at the distribution of the concentration from the plume, of course, the concentration decreases with distance is much higher here, close to the source, than here, and higher than here, and higher than here. So the more the plume travel, the more the cone opens up, the lower the concentration. That is very clear. But within the plume, within the plume, if we look at any downwind distance, and we take a vertical section of the plume, like here, we take a vertical section of the plume here and here. The assumption of the Gaussian plume model is that the distribution of the concentration in each cross section is by Gaussian. By Gaussian means that is Gaussian in the horizontal. You see my, my mouse, Gaussian in the horizontal and Gaussian in the vertical. 
with two different Gaussian distribution. One is characterized by sigma y, the horizontal, and the other is characterized by sigma z in the vertical. So the entire distribution of the concentration in my plume at any downwind distance is characterized by only two parameters, sigma y, standard deviation in the horizontal of the concentration, and sigma z, standard deviation in the vertical of the concentration. Done. The, you cannot have any air pollution model that is simpler than the Gaussian plume model. Of course, it's steady state. There is no time, as Jesse noted, which is a big limitation, but still it works. Um, of course, uh, the model is based on a transport by the wind. So if we have no wind, if we have calm condition with the wind equal zero, you cannot apply this formula, which is another big limitation, but the model basically works. Um, so instead of using the Gaussian distribution as a probability, like probably you have already studied in the past, I use the Gaussian distribution to describe the concentration value and its distribution in the horizontal and the vertical. So this is the basic formula. There are dozens of additional parameters and hypotheses that have been added to the Gaussian equation. For example, we assume that the plume is reflected entirely from the ground. So when the plume hits the ground, it's reflected back, which is not true, of course. A fraction of the plume will be deposited on the ground. So uh, there are limitations to this formula, but the basic formula works in many situations, in many situations. The the basic equation of the Gaussian plume model is this one. You already, you already saw this. Q is the emission rate in kilogram per second. U, for example, kilogram per second. You have to be very careful about the units if you, if you run this formula on your own. But typically, you will use existing models that do all the work for you. But if you do it by hand, which I recommend, by the way, I think at least once in your life, you should calculate this formula by hand, just, just to see how it works. Uh, but again, there is software that will do it for you. Q is the emission rate, for example, kilogram per second. U is the wind speed, for example, meter per second. Sigma Y and Sigma Z are the standard deviation in meter. This is the exponential showing the horizontal diffusion in, in the Gaussian form. And these are the two exponential with, for the vertical diffusion and the reflection from the ground. That's it. This is the basic formula. U must be greater than zero, otherwise it doesn't work. U must be at least one meter per second, otherwise you, you have a singularity. You cannot be too small, otherwise the formula doesn't work. Um, and what else? There is no time, it's a steady state. Typically, we use this formula hour by hour. Every hour is a steady state, and hour by hour we use it. Question, question. I told you at the beginning that the concentration decreases with the downwind distance is higher here and lower here. Where is X? I don't see X in these equations. Think about it. Where is X? X okay. Go ahead, Paula. Say it again. 
it is what we are calculating. That's the concentration that we are calculating C. And I don't see any, any X in this equation, but we know that C decreases with X. So where is the X direction in this form? Okay, I'll tell you, the X direction is in Sigma. Sigma is an example of Sigma Y, and this is an example of sigma z. Sigma are decrease, sorry, the sigmas increase with distance. Of course they increase with distance. Look at look at the image. The more the plume travel, the larger the sigmas. And the larger the sigmas, the lower the concentration. So the, the 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 dependence on x for the concentration is calculated by sigmas. And in fact, these are empirical formula of sigmas, sigma y and sigma z. Be careful if you use them on your own with your pocket calculator. They are log and log. So maybe a little confusing at the beginning. So this is sigma y in the horizontal, the standard deviation, and these are empirical formulas calculated from tracer experiments. And um, sigma y is a function of the atmospheric stability. Uh, we have typical classes of atmospheric stability uh, e and F stable nighttime, D neutral, high winds, uh, A, B, and C unstable daytime. Uh, so depending on the on the stability condition of the atmosphere, which again can be calculated by by the model that you run, uh, you have different curves for sigma y and sigma z. But of course, they increase with distance. So now you have everything to run the, the, your model. You have the emission rate, you have the wind, you have the sigmas, you have the geometry. You can calculate the concentration in any downwind point, any downwind point along the center line of the plume or or at the y distance so see is x y and z the emission is in zero zero h and the the concentration can be calculated at any point x y zero because generally we are concerned about concentration at ground level so let me repeat, the emission is at H, 0, 0, H. The wind direction is blowing toward X. The Gaussian plume formula has the center line going along X. And you can calculate the concentration in any point X, Y, 0 at ground level. This is the basic concept of the Gaussian formula. Gaussian plume model, of course. Um, there are a lot of pointers here where you can read more. There is this um, chapter seven in uh, my... Um, why is not loading? Is the internet working? Are we online? Can you hear me? Yes, Paolo. Okay, so at least the internet is working. Um, let me try a third time. I check all the pointer 
yesterday. Okay, no problem. Um, and uh, um, and there are other pointers here. I'm not going to show them to you. To how to derive the Gaussian plume equation. Uh, there are several theories that you can use. Uh, uh, I believe the the best theory is a simple semi-empirical derivation. There are many papers with hundreds of equations try to derive the Gaussian plume formula from um, from the advection, diffusion, partial differential equation. I don't agree with that. I think it's a questionable method, but let, let's skip that. Uh, uh, you don't need this discussion at this point. Very important, however, is the plume rise. Jesse already told you that uh, the real height of the plume is not the physical height, but the physical height plus the plume rise. Because the plume from a stack is emitted with a high temperature and with the exit vertical velocity. So there are formulas, which I'm not going to discuss in detail, but there are formulas that calculate this delta H. And again, these formula are calculated in the software that you will run. You don't have to worry about it. If you run the EPA model like AirMod or CalPath or any other model available in the market today, the model will do all the calculation for you. You just have to input the uh, correct value, the emission, the locations, the size of the stack, uh, the exit temperature of your fumes, the diameter of the stack. So th there are some parameters that you need to provide, input parameter, but all the calculations, all the formulas will be will be automatically calculated by the soft. Um, the most used Gaussian plume model is AirMod. Um, it is labeled preferred by the US Environmental Protection Agency. In theory, can be used up to 50 kilometers. In practice, I would not go more than 10, 20. Um, th there are limitations. Let me repeat them again. There are big theoretical limitation. Every hour is a steady state. There is no memory from previous hour. It is a straight line plume every hour. The plume doesn't bend. The plume goes straight every hour. Um, it cannot work in low wind calm conditions, but it is used all over the world, it is well tested, it is based on 50 years of development of air pollution model by the EPA. There are is fully documented. There are validation experiment, there are tracer experiment, there are tests. There is everything available, and you find all this information, of course in the EPA Scrum site uh, that I invite you to uh, examine. This is the air modeling system in the EPA site. Uh, it's not just a model, it's a system because the model come with AirMet, which is a meteorological preprocessor to prepare the meteorological data. It comes from another preprocessor, AirMap, which is uh, creating all the terrain information needed by the model. It comes with another preprocessor, air surface, to calculate albedo and other parameters that are needed by the model. So it's not just a model. It's a modeling system that solves all your problems and uh, if you buy the Lakes Environmental version that Jesse presented to you, it's even better because Jesse added uh, a GUI, a graphical user interface, and a post-processing graphics. So um, 
the original air mod version by dpa is free you can download it all the documentation and then there are these uh, user friendly version that really make your life better uh, and allow you to save a lot of time time and effort so um if you want to start playing with the Gaussian plume model tomorrow, there is, there is a user-friendly version that is free of charge, again, from our friend Jesse at Lake Software. It's called, um, sorry, I have it in another line. Um, where did it go? All right, I'll, I'll show it to you later. If you want to start tomorrow, play with the Gaussian Plume model, there is a free version uh, and no cost uh, called Screen View. I'm going to show you the pointer in a minute. You can learn how to use it in less than one hour. You can download it freely, and that will be the best way to start. Air mod requires requires some time, you know, I would say a few days, maybe a few weeks to learn how to use it. Uh, but uh, screen view, you can play with that tomorrow. So as I told you already, uh, Air mod is a system that has a lot of preprocessor and post-processor, my recommendation is, of course, to use the user-friendly version with a full GUI, graphical user interface. What is the next step? The next step is Gaussian path mode. Again, Jesse anticipated to you that air mode is a straight line plume which is sometimes not very realistic. If you want to be able to have a dynamic model that simulate pollution, not every hour, but every time minutes, you want a model with a memory that doesn't forget hour after hour, but has the memory of everything. If you want a model that can take into account of three-dimensional meteorology, not just one station, but three-dimensional. If you want a model that can use multiple meteorological stations, if you want a model that can work with calm, low winds, but if you want a model that is not too complicated, the next step is the Gaussian puff model. A Gaussian puff model are a major improvement with respect to the Gaussian plume model, but of course, they are more difficult to use, they require more study, more, more time. There is a chapter seven here. Okay, all my pointers do not work today. They were working yesterday, but I will send you a PowerPoint presentation and you will be able to access them. There is a lot of information here on, uh, for example, let's try this one, page 281. Okay, this one is working. This is uh, one of my most recent books. Um, I, I uh, wrote and edited four volume, about 2,000 pages on our quality modeling. Um, and that this is volume three. Uh, everything is available free of charge in APSI. Um, and if I remember well, in volume three, here we are. There is an entire chapter dedicated to Gaussian path modeling. Chapter eight, written by my good friend, uh, uh, Bobby Martino. And you have here all the theory, all the information, all the equation for the path uh, modeling. But, you know, most people don't need that. They just need 
the basic concept that Jesse and I gave you today. And then you need to install a model like Calpaf, which is again a EPA model developed for over 40 years by the EPA. It is the most um, used Gaussian puff model in the world. It's used by hundreds of scientists all over. Uh, and it's a much better physical representation of the, of the atmospheric diffusion. I wrote a short uh, summary of the difference between Kalpaf and Hermod. Here, again, in apps, you, you will find everything. Um, is a few pages you may want to read and interesting. Even though Kalpaf is theoretically much better than Hermod, <laughs> when you look at the performance, it's not very clear that the performance of Kalpaf is better than Hermod. It's still debatable. And uh, Jesse said the same thing a few hours ago. Um, so uh, I do not recommend Kalpaf because it's better. Um, it's theoretically better, but in many cases, air mode is sufficient. However, my recommendation is start with screen view, which is you learn in, in one hour. Then you can move to air mode. And then if you, especially if you have long range problem, you want to simulate pollution more than 20, 30, 50, 100 kilometers. For sure, move to Kalpaf. That is my recommendation. And this is just without chemistry. <laughs> if we if we start talking in a minute, <laughs> it may be tomorrow. If we start talking about uh, about um, uh, photochemical smog, we have to move to a more another set of models that are even more complicated. So um, screen view, finally I found it. This is a model that you can learn in one hour. It is, uh, um, it is given uh, free of charge, I believe. Yeah, it's freeware, a freeware, free of charge. You can download it from uh, um, from Lakes Environmental, uh, from Je Jesse Company. And this, this is great to start. You can play for a day or two, and you learn all the basic concept of the Gaussian plume model, of the uh, complex terrain, atmospheric stability, um, um, meteorological input, uh, plume rise, all the basic concepts can be learned using this uh, user-friendly version of ScreenView. And it has all the basic concept of AirMod. It's just much, much simpler to use. <clears throat> um, okay, so now the next... Uh, topic, uh, and we can start. I think I can, uh, probably you don't have many questions, so I can go a ahead until at the end of the lesson. If you have questions, interrupt me. Otherwise, I will continue to talk about modeling for another 20 minutes. Uh, excuse me, Paolo. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question uh, about uh, the, um, yesterday, recording yesterday. Yeah, uh, I post uh, my recording. Uh, if uh, could you send uh, for me the video recording? Yes. Yeah, all the video recording. I need to process them. I need to convert them, and mm -hmm. uh, I need to. Uh, my plan is the following for everything, uh, okay. and, and I will send you the slide immediately. Immediately within a day or two, but uh, the, uh, everything, slide, presentation, video, will be loaded on APSI. And it will take me maybe a week. And after I do that, I will send you an email. 
um, and with all the pointer on AppSy for the video. Um, so it, it will take a few days, but it, you will eventually you will receive everything. Uh, because uh, so you didn't send anything yesterday on uh, the email. Yeah, yeah, it will be uh, because I didn't follow. I changed the plan, uh, oh. and uh, but by by the end of today, I hope I hope I will be able to send you all the material for the first day and perhaps uh, the second day too. So it, it takes some time for you know zipping, preparing, and and everything. But you will receive everything very soon. Okay. I promise. Because some <laughs> because I need uh, uh, to make a review after the uh, the lecture. Uh, that's why I asked only. Certainly, certainly it will it will take it will take some time, but it will be quick. Okay, thank very you. good. So, so, um, so okay, grid models. Grid models are needed, especially for chemistry and photochemistry. What is a grid model? A grid model is um, a model in which you divide your domain, like if your domain is uh, 100, like a city, like Los Angeles, you divide your domain is 100 by 100 kilometer in the horizontal and maybe two, three kilometers in the vertical, typically. That's my computational domain. I divide this computational domain in cells, numerical cells, for example, you know, uh, cells of uh, one kilometer by one kilometer in the horizontal and maybe 30 meters in the vertical, each one. So I have hundreds, I have thousands of cells um, describing my, uh, my domain. And then I start the clock. I start the clock, for example, for a three-day simulation of photochemical pollution in Los Angeles. I start the clock at midnight, for example, day one. And then uh, I, I use a delta T, for example, of five minutes. So every delta T, five minutes, starting at midnight on day one for three days. So delta T, delta T, delta T. For every delta T in every cell, so thousand of cell every every five minutes. Every delta T, every cell, I calculate everything. Advection, diffusion, uh, emissions, deposition, Rain, if the rain cleans up, the there is rain, cleans up the pollution. Chemistry, uh, ozone formation during the day, ozone destruction during the night, everything. So thousands of cell, hundreds of delta T, and... Uh, dozens of chemical reactions in each cell. So you can imagine that this is a very complex and length calculation. This is what grid models do. In, in a nutshell, everything is repeated cell by cell, time step by time step, chemical reaction by chemical reaction, everything. Um, what are the equations that are solved in every cell? The equations that are solved in every, every cell basically are the Navier-Stokes equation, which uh, some of you may have seen before, but they are a set of very complex partial different, partial difference equations. In this pointer, yes, it works. There is a description of the equation. You may give a quick look just to be familiarized to what they are. There is a conservation of mass, the continuity equation, 
there is the conservation of momentum, the Newton's second law, there is a conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics, and all these equations are expressed by partial differential equation. For example, the conservation of mass is this one. I'm sure you have seen it before. The conservation of momentum is this one. This is Newton. This is the equation. Express in three dimension. And this is the splitting of this equation in the three dimension. Conservation of energy. If you remember when you study thermodynamics, that's the conservation of, of energy. Again, partial differential equations. Some of you may have some experience on how to solve partial differential equations. Uh, very, very impossible to solve them analytically unless you have a very simple application in one dimension, very simple. Uh, in practical cases, in three dimension, you know, no way to solve them analytically. You have to solve them numerically. So analytical is impossible. Numerical, you have, you, you, you can do it. You can do it. It's not easy but you can do it. Um, and again, there is a lot of reading here if you're interested, but I gave you the basic concept. I gave you the basic concept. In addition to the Navier-Stokes equation, you have to add all the chemistry equation, the formation of from NO to NO2 during daytime, from NO2 to ozone. And then there are there are actually hundreds of chemical and photochemical equations. So there are different models. Some are simpler, some are more complex, uh, but the logic is the same and is relatively simple. Every cell, every time step, uh, I need to solve all the Navier-Stokes equation and all the chemical equations. And the results are, for each time step and each chemical, you may have dozens of chemical or even hundreds of chemical. So the results are, in every location of your domain, at every time step for every chemical, the model will calculate the concentration. This is the basic. That's all you need at the beginning to understand um, to understand um, what grid model for photochemical simulation are. A few words on the numerical solution of the, all these equations. We use finite different methods. Finite different methods. Um, Again, you, def you, you design a grid. In this case, is only in one dimension. So there is a grid. Um, and in each grid, you do your calculations. For example, this, the example I show you here is the most simple partial differential equation that you can find is the gravity. This partial differential equation here tells you that the Second derivative of the distance in the vertical, they use y, but is z in the vertical. The second derivative of the vertical dimension, you know, the first derivative is the velocity. The second derivative is the acceleration. What is the acceleration? Minus g. g is the gravity acceleration. So this equation tells you simply then the second derivative of the of the vertical dimension is minus, of course, because the gravity pulls down, minus g, the gravity acceleration of the Earth. And this equation can be solved 
Actually, the, this equation is so simple that can be solved analytically. But if we want to solve it numerically, that's how you do. That's how you do all the calculation. And uh, the basic calculation becomes the inversion of a matrix. I'm sure you have studied matrices. And to invert a matrix is not easy, especially if the matrix is big. But fortunately, when you use find a different method, the matrices are three diagonal. They only have non-zero members in the three diagonal. And to make a long story short, a three diagonal matrix is much easier to invert. And that's why find a difference method worked relatively well and relatively fast. That's all I want to say on on this. I think this is a basic introduction, everything you need to know about grid. We also call them Eulerian model. A grid model can be apl applied to the entire earth. Of course, the grid size will be big because uh, we cannot afford too many grids. Uh, if we have too many, the calculation become too long. So uh, for global simulation, the grid sizes may be you know, 100 kilometers. Or we can apply to a continental uh, scale. And then the grid size perhaps may be 10 kilometers. Better. Or we can apply to a regional scale. Here is Belgium and Holland. In, in Northern Europe. And we can go down perhaps uh, to, uh, to one kilometer or half a kilometer for the grid. We can have a better, a better resolution. <clears throat> so the moment you start talking about chemistry and especially photochemistry, it's a completely different, uh, um, different uh, also for meteorology. If you want to simulate meteorology well, you need to apply a grid model, a grid model. Um, so the, you use grid models today for meteorological modeling, advanced plume simulations like uh, um, computational fluid dynamics shown by Frank Friedman today. If you want to simulate well a fire, Bloom, you need a computational fluid dynamic model, which is a grid model. If you want to simulate a dynamic plume rise, not just a simple plume rise as I show you before, you need to use grid model. If you want to simulate pollution in downtown, downtown a city, downtown New York, where you have street canyon problem, you need a grid model. And tomorrow, Dr. Musafir will show you a street canyon simulation. If you want to do indoor modeling, like COVID, I've done I've done some simulation of indoor for COVID. Here are the pointers. I don't have the time to show them to you, but please visit uh, this uh, presentation I did a, a year or two ago. Uh, if you want to do indoor modeling, uh, like in a hospital, to see the spread of the COVID uh, uh, contaminants uh, within a room to room in a hospital, uh, you have to use uh, a grid model, a CFD model, computational fluid dynamics. And finally, if you want to do photochemical modeling, you need to do uh, uh, a grid model. So I'll stop here. Tomorrow we will continue with from here to talk about photochemical modeling. We have uh, five minutes of questions or comments. Very good. Then I can let you go five minutes earlier. I'm sure you are a little tired, but uh, hopefully uh, the basic concepts are clear. We do not expect you to retain everything. That's why we encourage to 
you to look at the at the presentation and especially click on all the pointers that I did not have time to click on. Um, but I, I, I hope you got the basic concept to continue to work in this field. Perfect. Thank you, Paolo. Thank and you. See you tomorrow then. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good day.